bastards. You're gonna pay for that. After the fallen god of destruction defeats the only defender in Universe 10, he orders his minion to remove this ridiculous illusion that they tried to trap him and his squad in. But after the illusion is lost, it looks like there is another trickster, another defender here trying to stop the god of destruction from reaching the angelic palace and use their abilities of illusion to trap the squad inside this ship, ultimately failing in this task. After after being trapped in this illusion for who knows how long, they realize that the other universes are prepared for something. Maybe not them, maybe the other fallen gods of destruction and their angels, but they are prepared for something. So they should be going into the subsequent universes with their guard up. Even the venerable heir says that they have been missing from the cosmos for a millennia. So universe six may not be the same place it was back then. They need to have their guard up even in this universe so they won't fall for any trickery or get themselves ambushed like they did before. But we all know in Dragon Ball Kakame that in Universe 6 we have Vegeta training the entire Saiyan race to be warriors, to become Super Saiyan and to protect Universe 6 and their planet from the rogue gods and angels. And in this instance it seems that Kaba is facing a Khalifla who seems to have the upper hand. He shoots a key blast that goes completely off base, even Khalifla comments on this, but before she can even finish that sentence, Khalifla is attacked by Kaba who realizes that was this a distraction? Is this what you're doing? What the hell was that key blast? But with Kaba coming in so close, she has no time to react to the key blast hurtling behind her. But instead of using this key blast to damage Khalifla from the back, he uses it as a springboard to be able to knock Khalifla in the back of the head with his knee at full force point blank range. That's enough to throw Khalifla back and get her dizzy enough to not be able to react as quickly as possible or as quickly as she was in the past, leaving Kaba to shoot a key blast from his feet called Splitting Kick. And this is something that we have not seen, I don't think ever, I don't remember when we would have, a key blast coming from somebody's feet. This thing is moving so fast that Khalifla really has zero time to react and zero time to think, but even with that zero time, she uses the best that she can and she stops the key blast with her forehead, holding it in place and then gripping it with her hands, trying to stop it from pushing her back even further. But this probably is the worst case scenario when it comes to holding a key blast because as Kaba smirks, this key blast goes boom right in the middle of Khalifla's forehead, leaving her down and out and getting his first W over Khalifla's 18. And Kaba leaves the field having made a signature move. Finally did it, he finally defeated Khalifla who is far stronger, far more intuitive, and far more versatile than the very stiff Kaba, but Khalifla praises him for it. Vegeta is ready for them to take their training to the next level, their individual training is over, and they need to... Vegeta knows what time it is, the monstrous key that's coming toward their planet is of God of Destruction nature, something that unfortunately him and his team are really not 100% ready for right now. This is very early on, so he needs to pull out all the stops. He's at a disadvantage because he's been seen by the mysterious force. Even the fallen god is kind of perplexed as to what Vegeta's doing here, who this character is, who this being is, and decides he needs to take a closer look and go to the other side of the planet. But this is the side of the planet that the castle, the city, and all the Saiyan population is that is not fighter and that is what Vegeta yells at Kaba to do. He tells him to go to the king and tell him to shelter all civilians. Kaba takes his leave and goes straight to the king as Vegeta takes Broly with him because it's time for them to gear up. It is time for them to fight as one. Kaba flies at top speed trying to get to his location and as soon as he gets into the courtroom he starts yelling to the king that he needs to get everybody sheltered because he doesn't really know what's going on but Vegeta says that something is happening and 
everybody needs to shelter up, all the Saiyans need to activate, and the king needs to go to the training ground right now. But the king being one of my favorite characters, he tells him thank you, and is stoically at ease with this situation. He is not breaking his sweat whatsoever. He is in battle mode. The Saiyans use a brand new technique never before seen and combine their key to protect the planet in a key shield, all encompassing something that most villains or most evildoers wouldn't be able to get past. The king is surprised that this has started earlier than expected, but Vegeta doesn't really think that that's the case. But they're not here for a friendly chat, so the king needs to go and support his people and encourage the soldiers in showing that he has now 100% respect for Vegeta the king falls in line with Vegeta's orders. The fallen god's henchmen laugh because if this is a magic barrier, they can get past it easily. Remember, both these two are magic users, but the god says no, this is a key shield, and he will be the one to dismantle it. And he does just that, using not only his own key, but the power of destruction to basically Hakai the entire key shield away. With the key shield gone, they are sitting ducks, but the king orders them not to give up. They need to stand their ground. Broly wants to join, but it is not time yet. They need to buy their time and see what happens next. This god's fiends on one hand are interested in what this plan is, and these people are. They are far more prepared than any other species they've encountered so far, but on the other hand, this plan is counterintuitive because if you know what you're facing, this shield's not really going to do anything. So what is the next plan? What is going to happen next? And with the barrier fully hakaied, it is time for their super villain landing and the fallen god of destruction lands right in front of Vegeta and his squad. Well, here at last, damn gods of destruction. Vegeta asks the god why he's here, even throwing a little bit of flair and respect into his greeting, but the god completely ignores him and is scanning him instead, saying that he is strong, which Vegeta already knows, obviously, that that is where his power stands. The heir knows that Vegeta is not from here and has been trained by the angel Whis. He then finds out just by looking at Vegeta that they transform. Form. His power right now is not the power that he goes into battle with. He can raise his power level and has been trained in angelic techniques. Vegeta is a Saiyan like the rest of the inhabitants of the planet and his power is known. Basically meaning that the venerable heir knows exactly what Vegeta's power level actually is. Vegeta has not learned to calm his mind. He is completely pissed that he is being scanned and told everything to him. All the information about himself this guy knows and it's pissing Vegeta off. And once the venerable heir finds out Vegeta's name, he actually had used this time to wrap a chain around Vegeta's leg and bring him closer to him. This is something Vegeta was not prepared for and in his base form barely can withstand it. This is enough to kill him if he wasn't Vegeta. The skirmish begins with Vegeta in still his base form being thrown around and Broly tries to jump in but is stopped by the two minions. We finally get to see a God of Destruction level fight against Vegeta and I've been curious about this since the beginning of this Dragon Ball fan manga with the venerable heir attacking Vegeta and Vegeta literally just pushing himself back trying to create distance because he knows that anything close will result in huge bodily harm so he attacks the venerable heir the fallen god of destruction from afar throwing key blasts trying to hit him with anything that he can something that won't really put his own vital organs his body in danger and remember vegeta is on the back foot here but he did transform whether it be in super saiyan god or super saiyan blue he is not in his base form anymore after pushing the air back vegeta teleports right in front of him and an onslaught of venerable error and god of destruction punches come his way vegeta blocks every single one of them and then goes for his mask he is going to know who this guy is if it kills him. This is the last time I'm asking you! And in that moment, Broly, who the hell are you? shows that he's horribly underprepared for magic and quite possibly ends Vegeta's career 
in the defense of planet Sadala. Vegeta gets sucker punched by Broly through Dula's magic. This isn't something that would normally happen, but because we have a magic user, these sort of shenanigans right here are going to be something that our heroes, and even the ones that haven't dealt with magic yet, they're going to have to get used to as they face these foes for the first time. Because now with Vegeta getting sucker punched, the Venerable Air has Vegeta in his grasp. He has him in his hold, and all Broly can do is sit and watch in horror as his actions dealt Vegeta a critical blow. This thing was not a light punch. Broly is a heavy hitter and that was enough to knock anybody out. I do like this ability the Venerable Air has where he can kind of see in the past of the opponents or just anybody really and see what they've been through, what makes them who they are and he catches a lot of these guys off guard this way because he's telling them information like how do you know this information. Also I do like the fact that his head looks like the Ocarina of Time, that's just an added bonus. But Broly here, he doesn't understand everything that's going on, obviously it is Broly but he does know that Vegeta is in trouble and everybody on the planet seemingly is at risk of being destroyed by this false god of destruction. And so the Venerable Air charges Dula, his number probably three here, to face off against Broly, which I think is a complete mismatch. Although Broly's not used to magic, Dula is not used to Broly, so this is going to be a fun setup. I want to see what he looks like at the end of all this. But Broly is not having any of this, you're choosing my opponent crap. He attacks the Venerable Air only to be portaled back to Dula, which, I mean, this is a scene that you wouldn't want, anybody wouldn't want, facing off against the legendary Super Saiyan like this. But Dula must be certain of his abilities that he is not worried at all. He's actually extremely overconfident as a magic user, mainly magic user, and I wonder how he's going to really fare against someone like Broly who has no magic abilities at all and isn't versed with magic to begin with. Vegeta is still alive. The artwork for this chapter is just glowing off the page. It looks like it is in motion. It looks like it's already being ready to be animated. This Vegeta coming at the Venerable Air, covered in blood, still has that issue with that one arm that Android 18 broke so long ago. This is all awesome stuff. I love that little tidbit here. But Vegeta is not ready to back down. And if you think I'm going to let you humiliate me like that, you're barking up the wrong tree. Come on. Don't say things you might regret, God of Destruction. One of the cool things about the Venerable Air is this chain whip sickle combination he's got. One of the few Gods of Destruction, or at least a fill-in substitute God of Destruction that actually uses weapons and abilities. But guys, look at the way that the Venerable Air is using these weapons, like how the pages are set up how the attacks are coming at Vegeta, how they're going frenzy, they're going all over the place, Vegeta has to dodge out of the way. The way that he's attacking, the panels reflect that. It makes the page seem like it's frantic. It makes you feel like you're claustrophobic because of the way that he's attacking. And honestly, with a character in the Dragon Ball Super manga like Gas, who also uses weapons, I hardly ever saw that. The panels always look the same. In the midst of the chaos, Vegeta runs up right into the Venerable Air's face, but the Venerable Air grabs him by the head, and at this point, I thought that he was a goner. He thought he was gonna be having his head squished like a cantaloupe, but that is not what happened. Vegeta slams his forehead into his mask. Remember, in the last episode, he wanted to know who the Air was, but the Air would not tell him. He wouldn't give him his name or anything. He wouldn't say anything, and so Vegeta, his mission was to remove that mask, and it looks like he's trying trying to break it off his face. This is not what your past seems to show me. Scan me as much as you like. You'll never have access to who I am. You are proud. You have no idea. So the air hits him where it hurts. His other associate, Salaga, the one that looks more like a demon, he's actually looking, actively searching for Bulma right now. He is going to Bulma, and this is enough to give Vegeta a reality check that they're making this 
personal. And honestly, Vegeta in this fight has far more to lose. So does Broly. They are on a planet that have people that are completely vulnerable to these attacks and abilities, and the Venerable Air really only has his associates, and that's it, who are already extremely powerful. Unfazed by this information, at least surface mode, he doesn't care about anything else the Venerable Air is saying, and he again charges him with all his might. But the only difference from before is that this time, Vegeta, the OG real Vegeta, the one that the air wanted to see this entire time, is actually here. Who do you think you are to come all the way here to threaten me, my brothers in arms, and my wife? Vegeta bellows as he repeatedly strikes the venerable air over and over and over again. And with one finisher, with one final flash, he wants to end it now. One that seems to be covered in god key but what he doesn't anticipate is what comes next, and that is the Venerable Air's chain wrapping itself around the blast, heading straight for Vegeta and avoiding any damage. This sickle not only binds Vegeta's hands together as he is committing to the attack, but also cuts his face wide open. And the air just rides this up like one of Batman's grappling hooks. He just goes all the way up, completely bypassing this attack, and kicks Vegeta right in the face, but doesn't kick him hard enough to push him away. Vegeta is still held up, but he can be strong enough at this moment to handle this attack. That is when things start elevating for him. The air is now at full attention for Vegeta, this mortal that dares to fight a god of destruction and is surprising him at every single turn. And with one strike, Vegeta takes the invitation and punches the venerable air with both his fists straight into the side of a mountain. Pure unfiltered devastation, but again, this chain is not something Vegeta should forget about this easily or this fast because this is enough to wrap around Vegeta and hold him there. But pushing himself well beyond his limits going plus ultra here, Vegeta snaps the chains, breaks them, and comes down with the force of 2 billion megaton bombs. I'm just making that shit up, but that's kind of what it seems like right into the Venerable Air's mass and finally breaks it. On the ground, the situation is that the king is being a king. He's holding back the truce because he realizes that these guys are a serious threat to anybody here on the planet and just a couple of the best troops they have could go up and try to fight but they could also more than likely die and the war has not even started yet to lose anybody at this stage of the game it's still very early on so i understand where the king is coming from here but i also understand that kaba has been through some shit along with Khalifa and Kale, and they are ready to get through more of some shit and at least try to help Vegeta and Broly before something devastating happens to them. The fight between Broly and Dula is probably one of the funniest mismatches that I've seen in quite some time. Broly is using him as a toothpick. Any magic that Dula could produce, Broly is just kind of powering right through it, not really letting him kind of commit to casting any spells or having any effect on the battlefield and because of that he is just completely under the table when it comes to Broly. He is not even in the same league as him and it's actually kind of funny to watch somebody so cocky be completely unperched from their throne. The mask sadly is not fully broken. It is severely cracked though. Look like a crater landed right dab right in the middle of his forehead. That thing is shattered as of right now. It is broken but he is still left standing and laughing. This man is laughing like the menace he is. He does not care. He is having the time of his life. Vegeta gave it his all and you can tell the frustration on his face because this guy seems to be enjoying all of this but it looks like he has earned the respect from the Venerable Heir, and the Venerable Heir gives him his real name. It's called Amron, and he is just a stand-in for the God of Destruction of Universe 14 that is, as of right now, frozen in time. He is an aftermath, kind of a apprentice to this guy, and probably was going to be the God of Destruction for that universe himself as well. And we find out here that he didn't even need to stop at this planet. He wanted to stop here because Vegeta drew him to the planet. 
a guy that was trained by an angel that's just a mortal he needed to see him and obviously he does not disappoint vegeta is the real deal with bloodlust rising the venerable air wants more from vegeta and that is when vegeta probably does one of the sickest solar flares i've seen i guess he just uses his normal key to completely blind the venerable air on his own and he runs back to the other saiyans telling kale khalif and kaba to go find bulma the other guy is with bulma and that's when the king basically tells him that he probably won't take part in this fight unless his people are in danger which completely makes sense again the king is completely covered by me at all costs here he is doing the best he can with his limited abilities Dula puts broly to sleep that is the only way he could stop the madness and look at this guy he has had better days he just looks like he has been through it man this dude got clapped up he is not seeing straight his teeth are missing he's just completely gone and he uses this time when broly is sleeping to just start getting some free shots and he's just going in on broly hopefully trying to damage him in some way although i highly doubt he's doing anything but the other saiyans are kind of appalled by this behavior this is not a honor type of action that he's taking but dula he don't give a fuck he's doing whatever he needs to to basically win this fight this lack of honor is enough to even incite the king to take action with his lieutenants that he is going to stop dula which again dula is the small fry here he is not the god of destruction so of course he's probably feeling pretty confident that they could dogpile on him but that is when broly wakes up and just this page alone is just gorgeous the way they have broly when he's going into his epic mode or his angry mode his akari state now in this manga is pure insanity he just kind of looks like a street fighter villain at this point he looks like completely out of a different manga and he is trying to grab Dula he is paralyzing him with fear this is this could be Dula's end and as he begins to power up a finisher something that obviously is going to just smear Dula out of existence off the planet the venerable air feels that Dula's end is coming and actually telepathically links with him asking what are you doing and Dula's like oh I can't this guy's too strong I can't I'm done for and that's when Dula tells him exactly what to do after reading Broly a little bit more he knows what his soft spot is and how to get Dula out of the situation. So Dula opens up two wormholes and these are enough to stop Broly in his tracks. Out of both of them, he snatches Lemo in one hand and chi -Lai in the other. And that is when Broly, honestly, he just gives up right here. He's not going to do anything against Dula. He will stop. He will lay down his arms. I mean, the planet may be in danger, but Broly's not like a warrior warrior. He's not even like that civilized. He's he's basically really, really young in his mentality. And he sees his friends like they are they could be dead. So he stops. He's like, no, I'm not playing with this. I'm not double playing. I'm done. But Dula, instead of probably taking the heir's advice and, you know, using these hostages to get the fuck away... He's like, no, I'm not putting these guys down. This guy is a pure menace. And honestly, one of my favorite characters so far in Kakumi. Chi Lai tries, even in this moment, to reassure Broly that don't worry, we're going to be fine. This guy needs us as hostages. This demon is going to have to let us go at some point if he knows what's good for him. But he is not here to get out alive. He is here for revenge over the way that he looks, his face, his pride. It's hurt. <laughs> And in that moment, he kills Chi Lai, which I did not see coming at all. This is quite villainous behavior right here. This guy went a little bit too far with my Chi Lai here, but she is, she's cut through to the core. Broly is in the midst of losing it. That's what this panel means. This whole page is him staring at Chi Lai. Everybody else is watching not only Chi Lai, but what he is doing right now. He is in the middle, in the midst of transformation, similar to watching his father die before him. He is in that state. And seeing this last image of Chi Lai as she has blood gushing out of her mouth and she is in the middle of dying, calling out his name. That is when we get the next evolution of Broly. This looks like Venom Carnage. It looks so awesome. This is, I would call this World Ender Broly. This is 
beyond anything that we've seen before. It's been five months since Majin Buu was trapped in the demon realm and six months since the Grand Prix froze Universe Zero. Unaware of how to get back into Universe 7, he has a good time and stuffs his face with all his treats. Majin Buu is now trapped in the demon realm, but he is not sad at all. He's having the greatest time just eating all the garbage and candy and snacks all around him. He's absolutely in heaven, even though he's in hell. Between bites, he finally realizes that the machine that brought him here is still very much right in front of him, and he actually thinks about what the hell this thing is and seeing Fat Boo actually sort of kind of like do some critical thinking is a little strange but I like it. The machine finally reminds him of Mr. Satan and now being extremely lonely and trapped in this place he doesn't know if he'll ever get back at all. I can finally approach you Majin Boo. A man slowly approaches Majin Buu and he is quick to remark that he doesn't look like anybody that he's turned into candy so far, so who the hell is he? The man is the Archduke around these parts and his name is Traguna. Buu feels a sense of evilness coming from this man so he does what he has to do to protect himself what Mr. Satan said to do when he has an altercation with anybody that actually wants to mean harm to him and has malice in their heart. But the man stops him. Dumbing everything down for Boo, he says that he's in the demon realm, so even though he doesn't have malice intentions towards Boo, there is just gonna be malice coming from his aura because of who he is. What do you want from me? For five months, primary demons have been trying to approach you calmly and you have been unleashing your transforming ray on them to feed yourself. But you seem to have transformed all the demons in the area, if not more. So our sovereign asked me to fetch you directly, and here I am. Boo accepts that explanation and asks the man if he knows what the machine is. The man is not a scientist, but he has people that he can bring Boo to that can possibly find out the secrets of this technology. This is enough to get Boo to follow this man because he wants to get back home. He doesn't want to stay here for the rest of his life. Mr. Satan is worried about him. And with Boo off to God knows where, we go to Universe 6. We cut to one of the most unlikely pairings and that is Hit and Frost, with the latter still being in recovery from attacking the assassin. Frost goes back into his first form, while Hit explains that once you went into a coma, you were reduced to that form and you've been in one for the last five months, healing yourself and recuperating. But Hit has nothing for Frost and does not want to deal with him any longer. Frost starts reading into the fact that Hit did not take him anywhere to get captured. He basically sticking him back to where he started. He's not arresting him, he's not collecting a bounty on him, he's just essentially letting him go. And he reads into that a little bit too much. Hit has taken Frost back to his home world. Frost curses Hit's name and Hit tells him that he's not going to hand him over to anybody because he has not been hired to do so. He doesn't believe that Frost is any worse than Hit in crime, so he's not just going to hand him over to authorities without any payment. However, you left this planet abandoned after organizing piracy scenes on its entire surface. You then made its inhabitants believe that you had saved them from their enemies, who were in reality your own accomplices. You left the inhabitants of this planet in total misery after you realized that it was not worth a damn. And now they know you're here. They're just waiting for you to wake up and make you pay for everything you've done to them. So Hit actually takes Frost back to the planet to receive some good old fashioned vigilante justice, not official justice. Frost attacks Hit, but that is a poor move seeing as Frost is not even close to his strength at all and he is still recovering. You're not the only one who's consumed by a need for revenge. Do you feel that yours is more legitimate than theirs? I've shown you that I'm stronger than you. Now you have to show me that your speech is worthwhile. Then I'll think about it. I know how it feels to be forced into a mold, which is why my kind is so persistent. I'm telling you all this because it almost sounds like you don't like your job or even your life, perhaps. Frost begins to freak out because he doesn't know if they know exactly where he's at. They know he's here, but do they know where? 
but he just doesn't care. He's not going to make amends. He's going to destroy the planet just because he had brought him here. He thinks it through. If he destroys this planet, then the galactic authorities will find out where he is, and that's not going to be good for him at all. Plus, if he is going to get his revenge, he has to prove to Hit that he is serious about his own convictions. And so Frost decides to play along. Back in Universe 7's Demon Realm, the Archduke is leading Boo back to the palace. It is an honor to be in the company of the great demon Majin Buu. To see you during these months crush the primary species throwing themselves at you without letting the slightest trace of fatigue show was impressive. Who sleeps for a few seconds and is recharged for a long time? A few seconds, my my. We soon arrived at our sovereign's tower. Your sovereign, can it be? What? No. He is the ruler of this kingdom. The Archduke explains that they are superior, the nobles that is, to the other species that are in this realm, who are usually just artificial beings. They are from the same tree as the Supreme Kai's, something that Boo is extremely familiar with. When we emerge, we are destined to become either Kai's or Supreme Kai's, but it would seem that our existence as demons is related to the overall standard of living of the universe in which we are born. The more imbalance between creation and destruction increases, the more likely it is that fruits will become corrupted, giving rise to demon kais. I myself was born from one of these corrupted fruits, just like Deborah, the former king of demons whom you killed. And they finally arrive at the demon tower. The Archduke explains that the Sovereign is at the top of the tower. But he wanted Boo to confront the fighters on the way to the top before he actually met him. Who doesn't care about any of that? He just wants to go back home. He offers the Archduke the robot, the machine, and see if he can fix it, which the Archduke says he will find the scientists from his kingdom to look into the matter as soon as possible. Knowing that this problem is about to be resolved, Boo is ready to go all out. You just destroyed everything. Our most important fighters are now... dead. That's it? But why doesn't it fall? Well, well, gravity doesn't always have a say in this world. Who reaches the top, but there's nobody here. What a happy event to see you here today, Majin Buu. Oh, it's you, Sovereign? My name is Higatus, and I am indeed the absolute ruler of this place, otherwise known as Demon Supreme Kai. Boo recognizes the man. Thinking long and hard about it, he sees, yes, he was with Bobbity. Impressive. I didn't indeed have connections with the wizard Bobbity several million years ago. This does not make Boo any happier because this is not like Bobbity whatsoever. Certainly not. Bobbity was a selfish wizard seeking control over the world. He simply realized that there was some sort of unhealthy singularity in the depths of the universe, the embodiment of evil that seemed to take shape. But you were at that moment, it would seem, only a concept that fed on all that bad energy around it. My mission was to get you back and bring you here while he would bring to life the concept that you were. It happened exactly as he planned, and once you have come to life, you, Majin Buu, who, by the way, does not resemble at all what I observed at that time, you exploded with rage and destroyed 80% of this place, so Bobbity took the opportunity to leave with you. And as if all that wasn't enough, it was his alter ego, Bobbity, who had the nerve to come back here and force Deborah to be corrupted. So no, believe me or not, he was anything but my friend. That's all. Who did not listen to a word that he said, which is pretty on point with Boo. He actually had his back turned to him eating some popcorn. The Archduke finally catches up. I apologize for what Majin Boo just did. I had no idea he would annihilate the tower and the soldiers in it. Hmm. Majin Boo? What I'm getting at is that now that you're here and with war on the horizon, I want you to be our hound, our ultimate weapon. What do you say, big guy? I want you to fix that. Tregu thing said you'll fix it if I help you. It is the object that allowed him to come here. It seems that it's a random destination and that his coming is purely due to chance. Guess we're in luck. I want to talk to Satan! If our scientists fix your teleporter, would you consider my proposal? And Boo agrees, 
He just wants to see Satan again. Draguna, bring this object to the scientific area. You see, Majin Buu, I once knew the progenitor of those angels who sit on top of everything. And I am 100% sure she will want to enlist us in all the other demon realms of the universes. So I would like to have a consistent defense in case of need. That said, you looked much more dangerous in your old guise. But I think I know what to exploit in you to enable you to become stronger. I think you're aware of your ability. The absorption. Frost floats around the city only to see a double ganger that looks exactly like Hit that actually catches him off guard and he just skips on his way under the watchful eye of Hit. When somebody surprisingly sneaks up on Hit, or at least seems to, but Hit knew they were there the entire time. She has Hit if everything she's heard about Frost is true. Hit can't be 100% sure, but he is pretty relaxed about the entire situation. The woman has called on Hit but isn't very much excited to see Frost here. They wanted Hit for his ferocity, but Frost has done way too much damage. The truth finally reveals itself. They had called on Hit because he is meant to save them. The solar flare that's about to hit the planet and reduce everyone to ash is extremely powerful and seems like it may be too powerful for someone like Frost. Hit, it seems, is trying to test Frost whether he's going to save the planet or not. Frost becomes impatient and decides he's just going to end up leaving the planet anyway because if Hit won't teach him anything about how to become an assassin, any new techniques and become more powerful, he's just going to take revenge out on his own. I warned you Frost, I only aimed at your kidney, next time your heart will end up in lint. I see you, I follow you, no matter what you try to do to get away, I will stop you, understand? Scumbag, this man looked like you, where the hell am I? This energy, this strength, what is such intensity at such a distance, it's unthinkable. A monstrous wave of energy travels through the whole of Universe 6 in fractions of a second. No creature in the universe, when touched by such energy, escapes the all-consuming fear that plunges them into an abyss of unfathomable anguish. And in the blink of an eye, the rage of a saying echoes with a deafening roar to the heart of every life form, even light years away from planet Sadala. Eula laughs, egging Broly on further and further. The Saiyan who has gone mad pushes shrill and immeasurable cries, and with the simple force of his voice, the scream of Broly crosses the space at a dizzying speed and strikes all the stars on its way, even a distant star. Its planet system goes out in a supernova. The King of Sadala is beyond words. Broly's scream has not just blown up one star system, but it has lit up the sky with a sea of supernovas as it continues to break through Universe 6's barriers. He himself realizing what has just happened to Broly happened to him long ago. He's losing control and filling in with his Saiyan rage. The Saiyan King pulls himself back from daydreaming only to see Chi Lai falling down to her doom and he immediately catches her, ordering his Admiral to take Chi Lai back to the Tuffle Laboratories to attempt to save her life. Farsa, a normal Saiyan, asks to go with her, but she explains that there is no time to lose. Can you keep up? He says, of course he can. Good. With that, she takes Lemo and Chi Lai and they head off to try to attempt to save Chi Lai's life. As the king solemnly worries about Broly and what's to come with this outburst. What's happened to him? Why doesn't this big guy move anymore? You've absolutely no idea of the seriousness of your act, dammit! But with Vegeta's back turned to him, the air slices right through his shoulder, threatening him. If he drops his guard again, he will end him next time. Using his warping technique, he still has an ace up his sleeve and warps Broly toward one of King Sadala's lieutenants. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Broly rips this lieutenant to shreds, unbeknownst to him that this is not Dula, the man that killed Chilai, delivering what only can be described as a finishing blow that can be seen from miles and miles away. Ugh, it doesn't look good. Kill, you absolutely have to go back. Broly has completely lost it. You're the only one who understands what's going on in this state. And you, it'll be okay? And now she's understanding us. We'll settle this account to this coward and we'll join you as soon as possible. You can count on us. Good luck then, we'll make it. Broly. Oh no, Chilai, I need to hurry. Back at the battlefield, the blast is about to hit the lieutenant, but only the swift action of another one of the king's guards ultimately grabs him out of the way and saves his life. The venerable heir was right as always. The king confronts Dula. You knew he wouldn't just attack you, right? You and your friends are nothing but filthy scum, and you, the most obnoxious one I've ever met. Saving the lieutenant's life, the rest of the Saiyans are jumping into position, trying to save their home from ultimate destruction by Broly. My men are killing each other because of you, but believe me, I won't let you get away. Not you. And what do I care, eh, two-bit sovereign? I don't have to take orders from anyone except the venerable heir who's, by the way, taking care of your biggest asset. Stop procrastinating and get over here. Don't mess with me. Dula opens thousands of warp holes, each one with a new and different type of element coming out of them. The king having to battle against magma first. Every Saiyan now has to defend their home, not against the air or these demons, but against Broly, one of their ranks who's just lost all recognition of who is friend and who is foe. This is our moment! What are you doing? Keep your distance! Broly kills the Saiyans closest to him. Well, I've settled the accounts of this so-called king. It's about time. Fool, I've been through hell, and I haven't been afraid of the heat for a long time. Definitely not common on this planet. The Saiyans are in shock, seeing one of their own, headless, falling to the ground at the hands of somebody who they considered their friend. Hey, big fat slob! Mm -hmm. Is that all you got? What are you trying to prove by attacking only inexperienced soldiers? You're not strong enough to attack more powerful fighters. Admiral, what are you doing? Shut up, soldier. I know what I'm doing. Is that all Chilai was worth to you? And with these words, this lieutenant draws all Broly's anger, frustration, and rage toward him alone and orders everybody else to back off. But before the death blow can be delivered, Kale jumps into the action, saving the lieutenant's life. Broly, it's me, Kale! Kale attempts to calm Broly down. She is the only one that understands his rage, understands what he's having issues with, what his problem is. She asks for his hand to cool the monster, cool the rage filled within him. Broly grabs her hand and throws her away, severely damaging her forearm in the process. Process. Kale shoots a ball of key energy at Broly only for him to catch it and deliver it back to her but with his own toxic key attached to it. Will Kale succeed in doing anything against him? He has become an unstoppable beast, the exact representation of what our king hates in the Super Saiyan. But he's our ally and Kale knows this more than anyone else so let's trust her. Chaos. This is what I asked Dula. The greatest strategists know how to turn any situation to their advantage. It's all a matter of foresight. You like being a smartass like that, huh? Don't think I've forgotten you sent one of your damn henchmen to track down Bulma. I won't forgive you, you bastard. On a side note here, I do think that it should be noted that Vegeta is literally going up against a God of Destruction level being in Super Saiyan Blue. That's impressive. Yet everything seems to be going my way from the moment I set foot on this planet. I won't play your game forever, believe me. I can't wait to see your full potential, Vegeta. 
like before Broly grabs Kale by her face and only the force of Kale's key pushed him back. But at that moment, Broly becomes distracted by something going off in the distance and rushes to meet this distraction. But this distraction gives Kale the opening she needs to grab onto his leg and put him in a pincer, normally a move, grappling move that would get the opponent to tap out or at minimum not be able to move. But this won't stop Broly on his own as Kale teleports right into his face he shoots a beam at her, knowing where she was going to be, only the quick movements of her momentum avoided the fate of getting a key blast to the face, she needs to calm him down, face to face, berserker to berserker. It's me, Kale. Hear the sound of my voice, brother. We've done it before, I know you can do it. She came back to her normal state. She's crazy. No, let her do it. Chilai. Broly, I can hear your inner self. Here. Can you hear me? I know you're struggling not to lose control, Broly. I know this because the energy bonds I hold you with are no match for your strength. Yet your body is pinned to the ground, which is a proof that you are trying to pull yourself together. So take back control while you still can. No. But you must do it. Not until he pays. He'll pay. That damn demon will pay. But I can't let you go back. You won't just attack him. You'll do collateral damage. And we can't afford to lose anyone more. If you don't agree, I'll do it anyway. No. Absolutely have to stop him. Please come to your senses, I know you can- After receiving the death blow by Dula, Chilai is rushed to the Planet Sadala Medical Center by Admiral Fennel. Kaba waiting there to greet her, he can see that the events of the battle for Planet Sadala have become deadly, and Chilai's life hangs in the balance. Be careful, she's in extremely unstable state. Doctors, you must do something. Chi Lai? Oh no, what happened to her? One of these demons wanted to enrage Broly and he succeeded. After making it in the nick of time, Chi Lai's heartbeat is consistent and she is in stable condition. With Bulma behind her medical care, Chi Lai is in good hands even though she is in critical condition. Admiral Fennel does not know what happened. These demons, they just came out of nowhere and we were not prepared in the slightest. We were still in the middle of training the army and that's what happens. You don't choose your battlefield when you're being ambushed and that's exactly what this was, an ambush. Chi Lai wishes that she had been there to stop this demon from causing all this mayhem, maybe she could have made a difference, but Kaba is reassuring her saying that no, Mr. Vegeta asked them to protect Bulma, that's exactly what they're going to do. But even then, Bulma is a little bit uneasy, asking if there was any trace of the demon whatsoever because he had left long before they did and Admiral Fennel agrees with her, he should have arrived there by now. Chi Lai is optimistic in the fact that maybe the demon backed off after seeing how much guards and how many warriors there were protecting the target. Kaba dismisses all this because of everything that they've been able to use and do and contend with. Almost looking unstoppable, venerable air going toe to toe with Vegeta, Dula confronting Broly of all people, and now this mysterious warrior running around causing mayhem. Odds are they need to be on the offensive, they need to be on their guard. But security seems to be tight with this lone warrior taking it upon himself to get security to secure not only the building but the at-risk patients and people taking refuge in the building, that way they don't get hit in the crossfire. Parsa, you didn't feel any evil presence where you went by any chance, fortunately or unfortunately. Unfortunately, no. I have no idea where he... What the? Parsa. So that's your name. You may not be remembered, but you will at least be recognized as my first victim here. Why can't you move? It's rude. I have come to you in this case. I am only an executor. The venerable heir ordered me to take care of this Bulma and you are obstacles. The concern being that once I've taken care of you, I'll give the alert of my presence. Anyway, I had to act sooner or later. 
So let me tell you that I will be indebted to you the day we meet in the afterlife. And with that, in front of the Admiral and Bulma, Chilai, and Kaba, Harsa is dead. Somehow the villain has shown himself and Kaba is on it. He needs to get Bulma out of here because he is after her. You're right. 73, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78. If someone has the slightest problem, don't hesitate. Your father seems really committed. Anyway, I sincerely hope that Bulma's doing well. I don't see her with us. I'm worried. What are you doing? Checking the perimeter, Kaba and Khalifla come up dry. They haven't seen anything. Where is this villain? It seems they are too late. Salaga's power has been activated and he has taken over Admiral Fennel, doing the exact same thing to her as to what he did to Parsa. It is really cool how Salaga fights. He seems to be almost like a Sharingan type of user, maybe using hallucinations or maybe even using Sandman type elements where he puts his victims to sleep and kills them in their nightmares. It's something that we really don't get to see in Dragon Ball all that often. I'm glad that all three of the villains for this arc have completely different powers. Hep, hep, hep. Can you see me? Good. You'll be my second victim. Congratulations. What? <laughs> Doing the only thing that she can think of, Khalifla sucker punches the hell out of Admiral Fennel, knocking her out in the dreamscape in front of Salaga, releasing her from this torture, releasing her from imminent death, and unleashing the demon in front of all of them. It does seem like his powers work very similarly to a Sharingan user, someone using hallucinations against their opponent. How did you know? I know encounters like you. The worst that can happen is that they hypnotize us and make us powerless to move. Therefore, I warn my comrades that we must be careful to always stay together to react if one of us is caught. Bravo, Khalifa. You knew how to take advantage of Admiral Ruba's teachings. You had to act quickly while thinking about how to parry spells of this level. It's true that this big fatty has taught me a lot of things. I simply acted in the best way possible at the time, thinking that a strong enough shot could break the spell. While that may sound pretty reckless, it worked. Such a powerful magic is bound to have backlash indeed. Well done, but here I am exactly where I wanted to be. And he is, he's right in front of Bulma, exactly where he wanted to be. He just wanted to take the rest of them out through his special technique, that way he could just take Bulma no problem. We begin the new chapter of Dragon Ball Kakumi with the almost probable death of Bulma. You see her right here. They have nothing that really can compete with this guy. This guy is on a completely different level. He is beyond most Saiyans that are even on this planet and now they have to guard Bulma against him. But this doesn't mean that they won't try and one of the guards actually shoots him point blank right in the head. It even goes right through as you can see the smoke coming from the back of the head but he is absolutely fine i'm not sure if he was able to dodge that in time or if it just had no reaction whatsoever and it looks like the beam simply just went through him whether that is super speed or just part of his magic it just didn't have any effect and again, this guy is on a completely different level than all these Saiyans, anybody in this building right now. The chances of him killing Bulma are pretty damn high. But just as I'm saying that, something actually connects. Something hits him and pushes him back. And I'm loving all these Bulma scenes. I mean, tell me you don't love Bulma in Dragon Ball Kakumi. She just looks, it's like her best look. Not only does she look like a scientist, she looks kind of like future Bulma, but at the same time, you know what I'm saying? Like, she, she looks good. She looks good. Pepino, this is a character that we got introduced while they were just kind of bullshitting on planet Sadala and she is a half Saiyan, half Sephorian, which this planet has Sephorians in Kakumi Universe 6, has them still alive. She has different powers, she has different abilities, and so I'm actually curious to see what she can do if this is her moment, but I didn't even know her name up to this point, and they really haven't showcased her at all. Again, 
She was just a little tidbit, a little side note in when they were just hanging around that carnival and they were hanging out and showing Broly a good time. And I spoke too soon. I spoke way too soon. One shotted right through the gut. I would I would assume this is the reality of the situation unless she's got some sort of hack. Yeah, this is the reality. And I love Kakume. It just does not hold back in the gruesomeness of what the reality of these beings fighting each other would be. Even when Khalifla and Kaba attack this guy, he one-shots them also. He's done playing around. He does not have time for this. He needs to get these guys out. He needs to go ahead and kill Bulma, go back to the Venerable Air, and leave. They are on their way to bigger and better things. This is like a side note in their journey. But right before his very eyes, she resurrects. And this is where we find out that, uh, yeah, that's a dude. That is a whole dude, as you guys can see right here. It's a guy. So, yeah, I did not expect that. Just like what they're saying, I didn't expect it. Yeah, that's a, that's a guy. But now I'm interested because the chapter's name is called Zenkai. And... This is this is him resurrecting and coming back stronger because that's exactly what happens. Near death or death experiences give you jumps in power they used to. And so maybe this being is that's their hack ability is that they resurrect because of the Sephirian biology or technology and they get the Zenkai boost to ultimately become even stronger. Okay, this is really cool. This is a fight between a magic wielder and a technology wielder. This is a technology of Universe 6. He says it's the highest technological uh, land in Universe 6, world in Universe 6. I'm assuming the Sephirians are just that high tier and to the point where it looks kind of like magic what he's doing, what he did. And that is, uh, this is a really cool, this is a really cool dynamic. I actually, I am so here for this. Pepino coming in clutch. And ultimately, he takes the dub. He actually ends up blocking, blocking this guy and letting all three of them leave. The Lieutenant, Khalifla, Kaba, picking up Bulma. They're out of there while he holds them off. I'm assuming he's a little bit stronger now, or maybe a lot stronger after dying at his opponent's hands. So for a second time, the venerable heirs agent tries to kill, tries to kill Pepino relatively quickly with an overpowered attack. Like this thing goes through several walls and it's not like he's pulling any punches. He's trying to take him out because he needs to get to Bulma. Even taunting him like, try to stop me with your technology. You just can't, you just cannot. And I feel like there is a limit. There's far more of a limit in Dragon Ball with technology than there is with magic. Magic can almost do anything. While technology has, you know, things that you can measure, so it has limitations. Now, this attack could have killed everybody in this building, but he held back because he was ordered to kill Bulma. That was basically it. The Saiyans that he killed earlier, they were in his way. He is going to use them as obstacles or treat them like obstacles and kill them he's doing the same thing with pepino he's going to kill him he is in a merciful mood he's not going to just onslaught and slaughter the entire building he's not going to do that now they're having a classic magic versus technology battle where they both are using their type of illusion falling for both types of illusion i would say that the magician's illusion is far stronger than pepino's illusion but at the same time it's cool that they're going back and forth and this is just a rant these both these characters are ocs these guys are not part of what a traditional dragon ball is they were made for kakumi so the fact that they're getting this much agency and this much focus is awesome to me because it doesn't normally happen a lot of the name brand characters usually are the ones that get all the love in these stories oh and here we get the traditional uh underdog backstory this is this is like doo -doo -doo, doo -doo, naruto essentially because uh yeah this character is a one-of-a-kind rare occasion rare occurrence in planet sadalan regardless of how connected their society is he does not have the raw strength of the saiyans there's no way so he decided to make technology his power his intellect is far superior than any saiyans 
ever is or can be so he's just gonna use that to make himself stronger and give himself a one-up in this case and so on top of the resurrection technology that he obviously has and all these different abilities that allow him to even block this guy he has under his sleeve one more attack one thing that he has been devising since he was young to be able to kill and destroy even a saiyan and that is his masterpiece and he calls it twirling force which i can only assume it is high powered air maybe maybe it's connected to his own key maybe it's connecting and drawing key from everywhere around him so maybe it'll take some of the key from this agent and that way he can use it all to destroy him that is a very interesting power but i feel like he's going to unleash it and it'll just damage this guy and then ultimately this guy's gonna die pepino is gonna die that's what i think this is the part of the story that i've been most wanting to get back to and that is goten and trunks's training i feel this is where all my interest in this story so far is really going to because these two characters i feel like they had a glimmer of of love and and hope in dbz and then it's just been dashed away and just kind of like forgotten about dragon ball kakume is doing things differently and they are with Whis. they are harnessing their abilities they are making themselves stronger without just needing themselves to be fused together and now with months of training they have both risen to the rank of what goku and vegeta had been at one point and that is the mastering of god key and as you guys can see right here our boys goten and trunks are now super saiyan gods yes i i fucking love this this is the route they needed to go with they should already be super saiyan gods they should already want to be super saiyan gods and goku and vegeta should not be the only saiyans with god key and dragon ball kakumi is is correcting this problem Whis is a proud master here and we get a bit of information that really changes the dynamic of kakumi and that is that zenkais are basically back it's not just a zenkai to the Sephirian slash Saiyan that we saw Pepino. This is a Zenkai that is also for the Saiyan side as well. Goten and Trunks are both receiving Zenkai, huge amounts of Zenkai, after almost dying nine separate times and nine separate occasions. They were at death's door and that brought them back and that gave them the powers that they have right now. They are extremely, extremely strong. And after so long training, they finally reached this milestone. I love how they pop out of, of Super Saiyan God. You can even see Trunks right here, like half God, half, half just his base form. And Trunks, it means a little bit more because he does become Super Saiyan God in Heroes. So I actually think that this is like so awesome to give to the characters that are from Universe 7. They think that their training is over. They want to join the rest of the Saiyans to train with them and gain the abilities and their training from his father. And I just love this scene of, of Trunks with Vegeta. I think that this whole ending part being colored really gives a lot to the story and shows what is the most important thing here and that is goten and trunks and i feel like they are going to be a huge part of the story moving forward oh kakumi you spoil us they even give love to dbs superhero here where goten and trunks are just so happy to go back home they're excited they want Whis to give them a haircut they're just ready to go see people at home before they go train because they just want to make a little pit stop and even trunks says that he has an idea for a costume for them that looks like a superhero it's really classy just a lot of love for dbs superhero here but Whis is having none of that he's like are you ready for your next Next test because if y'all think you're done not even close y'all better wipe up that dried up blood all over your face because you guys are coming back for more and now i really do believe that they are the key to defeating these angels or at least being a super weapon against them they are being trained by Whis. Whis is showing them things like look at this room he is showing them something he's training them in something that that is angel-like, angelic-like. So I feel like this is gonna be where we see these two guys flourish and the story focus heavily on both of them. And Whis is being real with them here. Regardless of you guys mastering the God Key, getting into Super Saiyan God, it doesn't mean anything. Goten and Trunks have a warped view of reality. They were not there for 
Dragon Ball Super. I like how Whis calls it out. I said it earlier, but Whis really calls it out that they they were sidelined in Dragon Ball Super, so they don't have any idea the strength of Zamazu. They have no idea the strength of Jiren, and they have no idea the strength of the gods of destruction, the ones that came back. So Super Saiyan God is just not gonna cut it. It's not. Trunks is saying that with all of them, they should all win, and Whis drops probably the my favorite line in dragon ball kakami i'm not even going to sugarcoat it my favorite line in dragon ball kakami and that is it would be quite a feat for lord beerus to emerge alive he's setting the standard he's setting the what the power is of these guys and what you guys are really fa facing because if beerus manages to survive this if he doesn't if he does that weight of him almost dying or possibly not even surviving that long is something that they're gonna have to think about going into this battle because if Beerus is in trouble then what the hell are they even doing there? But no, this place is Whis's personal training room. It is connected to the room of spirit and time but it is his and in there four hours is equivalent to one earth hour so he can get or they can get more work in in this place and really train like the angels to maximize their effort because we see something in them and he thinks that they are the key to defeating everything. They are the key to winning this war. And actually I'm corrected here. I think Trunks is the one that corrects me because they're actually gonna be in there for six years. And so it's not six months, it's six years for the equivalent time exchange. So Trunks and Goten are both going to be like way older in their twenties when they finally emerge. And I just love the stakes here. I love the fact that we're going to get a time skip within a, a set amount of time within a story that has characters that have not seen these two in quite some time. Like I just, I love the ending here and they're going to have six years to do just what exactly they are going to have to strike Whis for the door to open for them to leave this, this space. They're going to have to hit him and that will show that they have surpassed every single person that they just held in such high regard if they can hit Whis and leave the room ultimately being the two that save Goku and the multiverse we are now back with Vegeta against the venerable air the air has stated that Vegeta has way too much power in the blue form than he should be currently allowed meaning that Vegeta's blue form is now as strong as it's going to be but has the potential to be stronger. But the air is literally digging into Vegeta's side by saying if this is incorrect, well, Bulma won't last till the end of the day because remember, he sent his minion after Bulma to really push Vegeta over the edge. Vegeta says, I won't pay any attention to your pitiful provocations, Moonface. I know these young people inside and out, and I know they won't fail. However, you're a little too prone to opening your big mouth for our interim god of destruction. Let's let our fists finish the conversation, shall we? The air is ecstatic about this because remember, this stop on planet Sadala is literally just a pit stop. It's not even something that he really desired to stay there long term. But it's turning out to be a great blessing for him because now he's testing out his strength as a interim god of destruction or essentially like a god of destruction in training against a mere mortal. He now wishes that this fight could last forever. But before the fight gets started, Vegeta realizes a horrible truth. That is that Bulma's key is gone. And if you don't know what happened, I'm gonna leave a link to the video prior to this one. Go ahead and check it out. This is enough to push Vegeta into hyper-realistic, cell-shading, dark horse type of manga panel because this is gorgeous. Vegeta is thinking the worst at this point. He thinks that Bulma has finally met her mark because everybody else could not protect her. I mean, they are going against somebody that is around the same level as the gods. So yeah, it would have been far-fetched for them to be able to protect Bulma on their own without a few sacrifices along the way, which is what ended up happening. And the heir couldn't be happier because he's noticed the exact same thing. My Bulma is gone. Her key has completely disappeared. And Vegeta's not thinking that Bulma had some sneaky plan up her sleeve, no. Vegeta's thinking that this guy killed Bulma. One of his henchmen killed her on his behalf, so... 
Vegeta is about to get cracked here because even the venerable heir is ecstatic to see what's gonna happen next. Vegeta goes berserk in Super Saiyan Blue while transforming into something that we've never seen before. The venerable heir also explodes knowing that yeah, he can't just stay where he's at right now. He needs to take it up a notch as well because Vegeta's coming out for blood. He has bloodlust in his eyes. We are immediately interrupted with the fight against one of the venerable heir's other henchmen this guy is the trickster he's the one that made broly go berserk and attack the rest of the planet sadala soldiers and so this is something that the king cannot let stand he's feeling it he's feeling like a bunch of key just disappear all over the planet everybody he's known is getting murked and on top of that, he can also feel the key from Vegeta's wife completely gone. And the only thing that this guy's got to say to that is, then the cleaning is effective, which probably the worst thing to say. This is where the king of Planet Sadala really takes a turn here because he is literally just kind of blaming himself for all this, which he, he is a little bit to blame. He has spent so much of his life not wanting to to use the the super saiyan transformation not trying to use the abilities of the super saiyan and be extremely peaceful which as you guys can see with kaba it is effective in making everybody very lazy so even when vegeta's coming to train everybody he's been on the back burner and when his planet got invaded by these these gods he has really it took him a while to basically jump in. It really took until Broly was berserk for him to do anything or to confront anybody. And now he blames himself for the deaths of the children and the soldiers and the citizens of planet Sadala. But Dula is just so happy. He's having the time of his life. He thinks these are big words for somebody who hasn't even landed a finger on him. Remember, he's using this sort of teleportation magic to not only transport other beings and just their attacks, but also himself. So he is probably the biggest instigator in all of Kakumi history. Like this guy is insufferable. I love him. But all that talking really bit him in the ass here. And I mean, this is like some of the most gruesome, gruesome Kakumi images that I've seen in a very long time. Like look at this, look at the blood just shooting out of his mouth. The king has struck him finally while he is so busy gloating about not being hit, which is probably the dumbest thing to, to gloat about because then you're going to get hit. He doesn't even have time to curse him out completely because he gets hit yet again, and this time an uppercut in the stomach. This guy's not really physically strong. It's his magic that's strong, and so somebody like the king, it's a perfect type of fight for him because he is kind of rusty, hasn't fought for a long time, isn't anywhere near close to the level as Vegeta, but at the same time, he is the strongest Saiyan, at least he was the strongest Saiyan for a very long time on the planet. And then he uses key manipulation. I love it. He makes himself a battle axe through his own key. This could be a heavy metal rock poster right here. I absolutely fucking love this. It just looks so raw on so many different levels. I can't even tell you how good this looks without going into an entire other video about it. Like this the artwork for kakami deserves a video of its own honestly but he looks fantastic and of course he's gonna do what he wants to do with that axe and that is cut my boy's arm off and then the king stops momentarily to ask him a question about the demons and if they love the darkness why do they always come out and try to absorb light dula only has one answer to this he says it's because uh, we are born from chaos. It's just what we do. What? What? Okay, that is sick. It looks like that's his arm. The demon's arm going right through the king's stomach. Like, look at that. I'm gonna have to do a warning for this video. Like, look at the blood just shooting right out of his chest. This, this is insane. Like, the blood is splurting right out of his mouth. This is, this is a death shot. He created a portal in the nick of time using that arm that was just severed as a weapon against the king to basically go in for a killing shot. This guy is completely insane. Not only is he durable enough to take hits from a Super Saiyan King, but at the exact same time, he has the magic 
to be able to face off against somebody like Broly. But the king realizes there's only one more thing that he can do. And so he uses all the key in his body and focuses all into his fist. And with that, as you guys can see right here, it's embodiment all around his fist. It just looks so darn cool. He sears the wound closed. And you can even see sound effects here of it burning the skin. It's burning his skin. He doesn't... He feels the pain, but he's not reacting to it, which is something that the demon doesn't doesn't realize what the hell is going on. I mean, look how beat up he is. Like, he has been acting and reacting to this pain all day long, but the cane does not feel it. After searing it, and you can see here that it is coming out of his mouth, because this was literally his stomach. So, him searing it and trying to close it up probably means he doesn't really have a stomach anymore, but, I mean, the steam is coming out of his mouth, so there's probably still some, some fluidity in that. But it is time for the king to take this seriously because he did promise Vegeta that he would give it his all when it comes to fighting these monsters. With that, the king begins to harness energy and you can see right here how happy he is because he realizes that the only way to kill this creature is to sacrifice himself as well and to sacrifice every portion of key that he's got in his body sacrificing all his belief sacrificing everything he stood for sacrificing the one thing that he told himself he wouldn't be doing he told vegeta basically he wouldn't be doing up until this point and that is go into super saiyan proper super saiyan for the first time in i don't even know how long he told it in his story at one point that he even tried to go into it but yes he finally goes into super saiyan the beard with the hair he just looks so freaking rad even got the little hair coming off here like he looks like a viking super saiyan i i think this is probably one of the coolest images in kakame we now cut back because remember kakame is taking a little hiatus till i think october or november so we're getting through all these stories as fast as possible but we cut back to the other venerable heirs demon the assassin who is now being used as a punching bag by a secret technique from the Tuffle Saiyan hybrid, the one that was attacking him in the last chapter. And he explains that he is neither Saiyan nor Tuffle, he is just a child of planet Sadala. So he is something in between. Remember, in planet Sadala's universe 6, he and the rest of the Tuffles live side by side with the Saiyans, and he is one of the very few hybrids that is able to use the Saiyan strength and abilities and uses the Tuffle technology in mind. But the demon's not hearing any of this and attacks him again right in the stomach. I mean, he must realize at this point, this is not gonna do much because he just pops up right behind him and attacks him again with the exact same attack. The one attack that is doing so much damage to him that he can't get past. These holograms that the Tuffle is using are just so detailed. They have smell, they give off heat. They just seem like carbon copies of the original and the magician is trying to figure out how this works. The Tuffle finds this hilarious because it's like, why as a magician are you trying to rationalize what's going on here? And I think that the demon is starting to like Pepino a little bit more. He's starting to like him because he is just drastically as a mortal, just trying his hardest to defeat this demon. And he's doing a pretty bang up job here, but I feel like there is going to be an ending here that is not going to be fair for Pepino. But before that, he gets hit again with this devastating attack, this time double by both the hologram and the original. And this attack is almost, I would say, like Rasengan, kind of. It feels the way that it is. They had it at the very end of the last chapter where he had it, developed it and he showed it off. But now he's realizing that he can use it with other holograms as well so it's almost like this character has become naruto by using clones and using rasengan attacks and this is cool because the demon is trying to analyze like his attack and who he is and even though the attack is doing a lot of damage the abilities the strength the speed everything is just still the same and you can see right here like it almost looks like chakra points and it just seems very naruto-esque at least this battle reminds me of naruto or some of the fights in naruto and he even claims that the attack isn't even up to speed, like it's not 100%, it's very very small, it's not fully powered up yet. But the demon still has one more attack up his sleeve and attacks him with a devastating key surge and this one is enough to go right through his body and fully put him down on the ground. While the Tuffle's body restructures and repairs itself because that's just some of the technology that they have in place, 
Yeah, this attack is called the anti-space punch, meaning that he can attack from wherever he's at and it will feel like he's right next to him attacking him. So these punches are as devastating, if not more, because of the fact that he can attack them wherever he is. He can be really far away and these punches will hit just like if he was right next to them. So this is a devastating magic trick and just the the uh, fighting between a magic user and a technology user is why this part of the chapter is so interesting and it looks like it's over for this guy he's still restructuring he's still healing but uh, the Neiman's punches are used in this anti-space um, trick I guess magic trick and he's hitting him almost like Luffy is with thousands of punches at the exact same time. So many that he's literally frying his body faster than his body can heal. Like this is just devastating to the poor guy. And he tried his hardest here to really save some time, buy some time for Bulma and the rest of them. But uh, he's getting toasted up here. He's getting clapped up here. And all it takes is one last punch, one last good punch for him to be put down permanently. But that's when the demon gets hit in the side and thrown into the side of a rock bed. As the smoke begins to clear, he looks onward and he's like, you're back, you make my job so much easier. Meaning that now he doesn't have to track these guys down. He can destroy them and use the magic of interrogation to kind of try to figure out where the hell is Bulma because the Saiyans are finally back. We see Kaba and Khalifla both in Super Saiyan 2 not sure what they're gonna do against this guy like that, but maybe they have Super Saiyan 3 right up their sleeve. We begin the new chapter of Dragon Ball Kakumi with the almost probable death of Bulma. You see her right here. They have nothing that really can compete with this guy. This guy is on a completely different level. He is beyond most Saiyans that are even on this planet. And now they have to guard Bulma against him. But this doesn't mean that they won't try. And one of the guards actually shoots him point blank right in the head. It even goes right through. As you can see, the smoke coming from the back of the head, but he is absolutely fine. I'm not sure if he was able to dodge that in time or if it just had no reaction whatsoever. And it looks like the beam simply just went through him, whether that is super speed or just part of his magic. It just didn't have any effect. And again, this guy is on a completely different level than all these Saiyans, anybody in this building right now. The chances of him killing Bulma are pretty damn high. But just as I'm saying that, something actually connects. Something hits him and pushes him back. And I'm loving all these Bulma scenes. I mean, tell me you don't love Bulma in Dragon Ball Kakumi. She just looks, it's like her best look. Not only does she look like a scientist, she looks kind of like future Bulma. But at the same time, you know what I'm saying? Like... She, she looks good. She looks good. Pepino. This is a character that we got introduced while they were just kind of bullshitting on planet Sadala. And she is a half Saiyan, half Sephorian, which this planet has Sephorians in Kakame Universe 6, has them still alive. She has different powers. She has different abilities. And so I'm actually curious to see what she can do if this is her moment. But I didn't even know her name up to this point, and they really haven't showcased her at all. Again, she was just a little tidbit, a little side note in when they were just hanging around that carnival and they were hanging out and showing Broly a good time. And I spoke too soon. I spoke way too soon. One-shotted right through the gut. I would have, I would assume this is the reality of the situation, unless she's got some sort of hack. Yeah, this is the reality. And I love Kakume. It just does not hold back in the gruesomeness of what the reality of these beings fighting each other would be. Even when Khalifla and Kaba attack this guy, he one-shots them also. He's done playing around. He does not have time for this. He needs to get these guys out. He needs to go ahead and kill Bulma, go back to the Venerable Air, and leave. They are on their way to bigger and better things. This is like a side note in their journey. But right before his very eyes, she resurrects. And this is where we find out that, uh, yeah, that's a dude. That is a whole dude, as you guys can see right here. It's a guy. So, yeah, I did not expect that. Just like what they're saying, I didn't expect it. Yeah, that's a, that's a guy. But now I'm interested because the chapter's name is called Zenkai. And... 
this is this is him resurrecting and coming back stronger because that's exactly what happens near death or death experiences give you jumps in power or they used to and so maybe this being is that's their hack ability is that they resurrect because of the Sephirian biology or technology and they get the Zenkai boost to ultimately become even stronger. Okay, this is really cool. This is a fight between a magic wielder and a technology wielder. This is a technology of Universe 6. He says it's the highest technological uh, land in Universe 6, world in Universe 6. I'm assuming the Sephirians are just that high tier and to the point where it looks kind of like magic what he's doing what he did and that is uh this is a really cool this is a really cool dynamic i actually i am so here for this pepino coming in clutch and ultimately he takes the dub he actually ends up blocking blocking this guy and letting all three of them leave the lieutenant Khalifa, Kaba, picking up Bulma, they're out of there while he holds them off. I'm assuming he's a little bit stronger now, or maybe a lot stronger after dying at his opponent's hands. So for a second time, the venerable heirs agent tries to kill, tries to kill Pepino relatively quickly with an overpowered attack. Like this thing goes through several walls and it's not like he's pulling any punches he's trying to take him out because he needs to get the bulma even taunting him like try to stop me with your technology you just can't you just cannot and i feel like there is a limit there's far more of a limit in dragon ball with technology than there is with magic magic can almost do anything while technology has you know things that you can measure so it has limitations now this attack could have killed everybody in this building but he held back because he was ordered to kill bulma that was basically it the saiyans that he killed earlier they were in his way he is going to use them as obstacles or treat them like obstacles and kill them he's doing the same thing with pepino he's going to kill him he is in a merciful mood he's not going to just onslaught and slaughter the entire building he's not going to do that now they're having a classic magic versus technology battle where they both are using their type of illusion falling for both types of illusion i would say that the magician's illusion is far stronger than pepino's illusion but at the same time it's cool that they're going back and forth and this is just a rant these both these characters are ocs these guys are not part of what a traditional dragon ball is they were made for kakumi so the fact that they're getting this much agency and this much focus is awesome to me because it doesn't normally happen a lot of the name brand characters usually are the ones they get all the love in these stories. Oh, and here we get the traditional uh, underdog backstory. This is, this is like, do 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 Naruto essentially because uh, yeah, this character is a one of a kind, rare occasion, rare occurrence in Planet Sadalan. Regardless of how connected their society is, he does not have the raw strength of the Saiyans there's no way so he decided to make technology his power his intellect is far superior than any Saiyans ever is or can be so he's just going to use that to make himself stronger and give himself a one-up in this case and so on top of the resurrection technology that he obviously has and all these different abilities that allow him to even block this guy he has under his sleeve one more attack one thing that he has been devising since he was young to be able to kill and destroy even a saiyan and that is his masterpiece and he calls it twirling force which i can only assume it is high powered air maybe maybe it's connected to his own key maybe it's connecting and drawing key from everywhere around him so maybe it'll take some of the key from this agent and that way he can use it all to destroy him that is a very interesting power but i feel like he's going to unleash it and it'll just damage this guy and then ultimately this guy's gonna die pepino is gonna die that's what i think this is the part of the story that i've been most wanting to get back to and that is goten and trunks's training i feel this is where all my interest in this story so far is really going to because these two characters i feel like they had a glimmer of of love and and hope in dbz and then it's just been dashed away and just kind of like forgotten about 
Dragon Ball Kakumei is doing things differently and they are with Whis, they are harnessing their abilities, they are making themselves stronger without just needing themselves to be fused together and now with months of training they have both risen to the rank of what Goku and Vegeta had been at one point and that is the mastering of God Key. and as you guys can see right here our boys Goten and Trunks are now Super Saiyan Gods yes I I fucking love this. This is the route they needed to go with. They should already be Super Saiyan Gods. They should already want to be Super Saiyan Gods. And Goku and Vegeta should not be the only Saiyans with God Key. And Dragon Ball Kakumi is, is correcting this problem. Whis is a proud master here. And we get a bit of information that really changes the dynamic of Kakumi. And that is that Zenkais are basically back. It's not just a Zenkai to the Sephirian slash Saiyan that we saw Pepino. This is a Zenkai that is also for the Saiyan side as well. Goten and Trunks are both receiving Zenkai, huge amounts of Zenkai, after almost dying nine separate times in nine separate occasions. They were at death's door and that brought them back and that gave them the powers that they have right now. They are extremely, extremely strong. And after so long training, they finally reached this milestone. I love how they pop out of, of Super Saiyan God. You can even see Trunks right here, like half God, half, half just his base form. And Trunks, it means a little bit more because he does become Super Saiyan God in Heroes. So I actually think that this is like so awesome to give to the characters that are from Universe 7. They think that their training is over. They want to join the rest of the Saiyans to train with them and gain the abilities and their training from his father. And I just love this scene of, of Trunks with Vegeta. I think that this whole ending part being colored really gives a lot to the story and shows what is the most important thing here and that is Goten and Trunks and I feel like they are going to be a huge part of the story moving forward. Oh Kakumi you spoil us. They even give love to DBS superhero here where Goten and Trunks are just so happy to go back home. They're excited. They want Whis to give them a haircut. They're just ready to go see people at home before they go train because they just want to make a little pit stop and even Trunks says that he he has an idea for a costume for them that looks like a superhero. It's really classy. Just a lot of love for DBS superhero here. But Whis is having none of that. He's like, are you ready for your next test? Because if y'all think you're done, not even close. Y'all better wipe up that dried up blood all over your face because you guys are coming back for more. And now I really do believe that they are the key to defeating these angels or at least being a super weapon against them they are being trained by Whis. Whis is showing them things like look at this room he is showing them something he's training them in something that that is angel like angelic like so i feel like this is gonna be where we see these two guys flourish and the story focus heavily on both of them and Whis is being real with them here regardless of you guys mastering the god key getting into super saiyan god it doesn't mean anything Goten and Trunks have a warped view of reality. They were not there for Dragon Ball Super. I like how Whis calls it out. I said it earlier, but Whis really calls it out that they they were sidelined at Dragon Ball Super, so they don't have any idea the strength of Zamazu. They have no idea the strength of Jiren, and they have no idea the strength of the Gods of Destruction, the ones that came back. So Super Saiyan God is just not gonna cut it, it's not. Trunks is saying that with all of them, they should all win and Whis drops probably the my favorite line in Dragon Ball Kakamei. I'm not even gonna sugarcoat it. My favorite line in Dragon Ball Kakamei and that is, it would be quite a feat for Lord Beerus to emerge alive. He's setting the standard. He's setting the what the power is of these guys and what you guys are really fa facing because if Beerus manages to survive this, if he doesn't, if he does, that weight of him almost dying or possibly not even surviving that long is something that they're going to have to think about going into this battle because if Beerus is in trouble, then what the hell are they even doing there? But no, this place is Whis's personal training room. It is connected to the room of spirit and time, but it is his. And in there, four hours is equivalent to one earth hour. So he can get, or they can get more work in, in this place and really train like the angels 
to maximize their effort because we see something in them and he thinks that they are the key to defeating everything. They are the key to winning this war. And actually I'm corrected here. I think Trunks is the one that corrects me because they're actually gonna be in there for six years. And so it's not six months, it's six years for the equivalent time exchange. So Trunks and Goten are both going to be like way older in their 20s when they finally emerge. And I just love the stakes here. I love the fact that we're going to get a time skip within a, a set amount of time within a story that has characters that have not seen these two in quite some time. Like I just, I love the ending here and they're going to have six years to do just what exactly they are going to have to strike Whis for the door to open for them to leave this, this space they're gonna have to hit him. And that will show that they have surpassed every single person that they just held in such high regard. If they can hit Whis and leave the room. Ultimately being the two that save Goku and the multiverse. We are now back with Vegeta against the venerable heir. The heir has stated that Vegeta has way too much power in the blue form than he should be currently allowed meaning that vegeta's blue form is now as strong as it's going to be but has the potential to be stronger but the air is literally digging into vegeta's side by saying if this is incorrect well bulma won't last till the end of the day because remember he sent his minion after bulma to really push vegeta over the edge vegeta says i won't pay any attention to your pitiful provocations moon face i know these young people inside and out and i know they won't fail However, you're a little too prone to opening your big mouth for our interim god of destruction. Let's let our fist finish the conversation, shall we? The air is ecstatic about this because remember, this stop on planet Sadala is literally just a pit stop. It's not even something that he really desired to stay there long term. But it's turning out to be a great blessing for him because now he's testing out his strength as a interim god of destruction or essentially like a god of destruction in training against a mere mortal. He now wishes that this fight could last forever. But before the fight gets started, Vegeta realizes a horrible truth. That is that Bulma's key is gone. And if you don't know what happened, I'm gonna leave a link to the video prior to this one. Go ahead and check it out. This is enough to push Vegeta into hyper-realistic, cel-shading, dark horse type of manga panel because this is gorgeous. Vegeta is thinking the worst at this point. He thinks that Bulma has finally met her mark because everybody else could not protect her. I mean, they are going against somebody that is around the same level as the gods. So yeah, it would have been far-fetched for them to be able to protect Bulma on their own without a few sacrifices along the way, which is what ended up happening. And the heir couldn't be happier because he's noticed the exact same thing. My Bulma is gone. Her key has completely disappeared. And Vegeta's not thinking that Bulma had some sneaky plan up her sleeve, no. Vegeta's thinking that this guy killed Bulma. One of his henchmen killed her on his behalf, so... Vegeta is about to get cracked here because even the venerable heir is ecstatic to see what's going to happen next. Vegeta goes berserk in Super Saiyan Blue while transforming into something that we've never seen before. The venerable heir also explodes knowing that yeah, he can't just stay where he's at right now. He needs to take it up a notch as well because Vegeta's coming out for blood. He has bloodlust in his eyes. We are immediately interrupted with the fight against one of the venerable heirs other henchmen this guy is the trickster he's the one that made broly go berserk and attack the rest of the planet sadala soldiers and so this is something that the king cannot let stand he's feeling it he's feeling like a bunch of key just disappear all over the planet everybody he's known is getting murked and on top of that, he can also feel the key from Vegeta's wife completely gone. And the only thing that this guy's got to say to that is, then the cleaning is effective, which probably the worst thing to say. This is where the king of Planet Sadala really takes a turn here because he is literally just kind of blaming himself for all this, which he, he is a little bit 
to blame. He has spent so much of his life not wanting to to use the, the Super Saiyan transformation, not trying to use the abilities of the Super Saiyan and be extremely peaceful, which, as you guys can see with Kaba, it is effective in making everybody very lazy. So even when Vegeta's coming to train everybody, he's been on the back burner. And when his planet got invaded by these, these gods, he has really... It took him a while to basically jump in. It really took until Broly was berserk for him to do anything or to confront anybody. And now he blames himself for the deaths of the children and the soldiers and the citizens of planet Sadala. Badula is just so happy. He's having the time of his life. He thinks these are big words for somebody who hasn't even landed a finger on him. Remember, he's using this sort of teleportation magic to not only transport other beings and just their attacks, but also himself. So he is probably the biggest instigator in all of Kakumi history. Like this guy is insufferable. I love him. But all that talking really bit him in the ass here and I mean this is like some of the most gruesome gruesome Kakumi images that I've seen in a very long time like look at this look at the blood just shooting out of his mouth the king has struck him finally while he is so busy gloating about not being hit which is probably the dumbest thing to to gloat about because then you're gonna get hit he doesn't even have time to curse him out completely because he gets hit yet again and this time an uppercut in the stomach this guy's not really physically strong it's his magic that's strong and so somebody like the king it's a perfect type of fight for him because he is kind of rusty hasn't fought for a long time isn't anywhere near close to the level as vegeta but at the same time, he is the strongest Saiyan, at least he was the strongest Saiyan for a very long time on the planet. And then he uses key manipulation. I love it. He makes himself a battle axe through his own key. This could be a heavy metal rock poster right here. I absolutely fucking love this. It just looks so raw on so many different levels. I can't even tell you how good this looks without going into an entire other video about it. Like this the artwork for Kakami deserves a video of its own honestly but he looks fantastic and of course he's gonna do what he wants to do with that axe and that is cut my boy's arm off and then the king stops momentarily to ask him a question about the demons and if they love the darkness why do they always come out and try to absorb light Dula only has one answer to this he says it's because uh, we are born from chaos. It's just what we do. What? What? Okay, that is sick. It looks like that's his arm. The demon's arm going right through the king's stomach. Like, look at that. I'm gonna have to do a warning for this video. Like, look at the blood just shooting right out of his chest. This, this is insane. Like, the blood is splurting right out of his mouth. This is, this is a death shot. He created a portal in the nick of time using that arm that was just severed as a weapon against the king to basically go in for a killing shot. This guy is completely insane. Not only is he durable enough to take hits from a Super Saiyan King, but at the exact same time, he has the magic to be able to face off against somebody like Broly. But the king realizes there's only one more thing that he can do. And so he uses all the key in his body and focuses all into his fist. And with that, as you guys can see right here, it's embodiment all around his fist. It just looks so darn cool. He sears the wound closed. And you can even see sound effects here of it burning the skin. It's burning his skin. He doesn't, he feels the pain, but he's not reacting to it, which is something that the demon doesn't, doesn't realize what the hell's going on. I mean, look how beat up he is. Like he has been acting and reacting to this pain all day long but the cane does not feel it after searing it and you can see here that it is coming out of his mouth because this was literally his stomach so him searing it and trying to close it up probably means he doesn't really have a stomach anymore but I mean the steam is coming out of his mouth so there's probably still some some fluidity in that but it is time for the king to take this seriously because he did promise Vegeta that he would give it his all when he comes to fighting these monsters. With that, the king begins to harness energy and you can see right here how happy he is because he realizes that the only way to kill this creature is to sacrifice himself as well and to sacrifice every 
portion of key that he's got in his body. Sacrificing all his belief, sacrificing everything he stood for, sacrificing the one thing that he told himself he wouldn't be doing. He told Vegeta, basically, he wouldn't be doing up until this point, and that is go into Super Saiyan, proper Super Saiyan, for the first time in I don't even know how long he told it in his story at one point that he even tried to go into it but yes he finally goes into Super Saiyan the beard with the hair he just looks so freaking rad even got the little hair coming off here like he looks like a Viking Super Saiyan I I think this is probably one of the coolest images in Kakame we now cut back because remember Kakame is taking a little hiatus till I think October or November so we're getting through all these stories as fast as possible but we cut back to the other venerable heirs demon the assassin who is now being used as a punching bag by a secret technique from the tuffle saiyan hybrid the one that was attacking him in the last chapter and he explains that he is neither saiyan nor tuffle he is just a child of planet sadala so he is something in between remember in planet sadala's universe 6 he and the rest of the Tuffles live side by side with the Saiyans and he is one of the very few hybrids that is able to use the Saiyan strength and abilities and use this, the Tuffle technology in mind. But the demon's not hearing any of this and attacks him again right in the stomach. I mean, he must realize at this point this is not going to do much because he just pops up right behind him and attacks him again with the exact same attack. The one attack that is doing so much damage to him that he can't get past. These holograms that the Tuffle is using are just so detailed. They have smell, they give off heat, they just seem like carbon copies of the original and the magician is trying to figure out how this works. The Tuffle finds this hilarious because it's like, why as a magician are you trying to rationalize what's going on here? And I think that the demon is starting to like Pepino a little bit more. He's starting to like him because he is just drastically as a mortal, just trying his hardest to defeat this demon. And he's doing a pretty bang up job here, but I feel like there is going to be an ending here that is not going to be fair for Pepino. But before that, he gets hit again with this devastating attack, this time double by both the hologram and the original. And this attack is almost, I would say, like Rasengan, kind of. It feels the way that it is. They had it at the very end of the last chapter where he had it, developed it and he showed it off. But now he's realizing that he can use it with other holograms as well so it's almost like this character has become naruto by using clones and using rasengan attacks and this is cool because the demon is trying to analyze like his attack and who he is and even though the attack is doing a lot of damage the abilities the strength the speed everything is just still the same and you can see right here like it almost looks like chakra points and it just seems very naruto-esque at least this battle reminds me of naruto or some of the fights in naruto and he even claims that the attack isn't even up to speed, like it's not 100%, it's very very small, it's not fully powered up yet. But the demon still has one more attack up his sleeve and attacks him with a devastating key surge and this one is enough to go right through his body and fully put him down on the ground. While the Tuffle's body restructures and repairs itself because that's some of the technology that they have in place, yeah, this attack is called the anti-space punch, meaning that he can attack from wherever he's at and it will feel like he's right next to him attacking him. So these punches are as devastating, if not more, because of the fact that he can attack them wherever he is. He can be really far away and these punches will hit just like if he was right next to them. So this is a devastating magic trick and just the the uh, fighting between a magic user and a technology user is why this part of the chapter is so interesting and it looks like it's over for this guy he's still restructuring he's still healing but uh, the demon's punches are used in this anti-space um, trick i guess magic trick and he's hitting him almost like luffy is with thousands of punches at the exact same time. So many that he's literally frying his body faster than his body can heal. Like this is just devastating to the poor guy and he tried his hardest here to really save some time, buy some time for Bulma and the rest of them, but uh, he's getting toasted up here. He's getting clapped up here. And all it takes is one last punch, one last good punch for him to be put down permanently. But that's when the demon gets hit in the side and thrown into the side of a rock bed. As the smoke begins to clear, he looks onward and he's like, 
you're back. You make my job so much easier, meaning that now he doesn't have to track these guys down. He can destroy them and use the magic of interrogation to kind of try to figure out where the hell is Bulma because the Saiyans are finally back. We see Kaba and Khalifla both in Super Saiyan 2. Not sure what they're going to do against this guy like that, but maybe they have Super Saiyan 3 right up their sleeve. It is now up to Kaba, Khalifla, and the lieutenant to save Bulma's life against an evil demon who is hell-bent on killing her on the orders of a rogue god of destruction. We are back with Dragon Ball Kakume, and let's jump into the chapter. And right off the bat, they have to do this without one of their own or two of their own because Pepino, the artificial tuffle, the half Saiyan, half tuffle hybrid, is absolutely injured, completely damaged, and needs repair. So the lieutenant is going to bring him over to the tuffle laboratories to get him looked at while Khalifla and Kaba valiantly hold off this demon who has been literally running through everybody, running fade on every single character on planet Sadala since he's arrived. This is one of the strongest characters in Dragon Ball Kakumi, and I mean, he's facing against Kaba and Khalifla. But Pepino stops them and says that, don't worry, he will take care of me, take care of everything. You don't have to worry about a thing. And when she's asking, what are you talking about? A growth starts coming out of Pepino's back, only to morph into some sort of humanoid cell slash cooler looking creature, almost looking like what you would imagine a Tuffle to look like. But what is this thing? So the creature's name is Kebia and was created by his father, implanted into Pepino, and comes out in times of need. In case he gets hurt or he needs healing, this creature repairs him, which is really interesting for a technology that could benefit everybody but Pepino is the Saiyan's version of an artificial android basically so uh, it makes sense that this creature is attached to him and him only. Kaba and Khalifla keep their eyes off the prize for just a few seconds but those seconds were precious and in a fight against somebody who has been basically decimating everybody he's come across, that was not the smartest idea because in their absent thought, both of them get rocked by two fists right in the face. This should have knocked them out instantly, how strong this creature actually is. But they weren't actually hits, they were actually slaps or backhands, if you will, and they were not meant to destroy them or kill them at all. It was just to get their attention, get them back into the fight by just bitch slapping them, which is, like I said, this demon is completely out of pocket most of the time and one of the strongest warriors in the Dragon Ball verse, at least in this version. Khalifla sporting her brand new Super Saiyan 3 transformation, stares right into Salaga's eyes and tries to punch him only for it to completely fail, showing the extent of distance between the power levels of this demon and a Super Saiyan 3 Saiyan. She goes in and tries to knee him and he catches that as well, evading it gracefully, but that's when Kaba jumps in and again, this is a 2v1. So of course, this is absolutely fair in this fight, but even then, just like the way that he's blocking their, their punches, it even seems like they may be weaker than Pepino when it comes to power levels or at least fighting strength. Kaba's attack makes no difference whatsoever. Remember, Salaga is completely immune to key attacks, so they have to go with a completely different type of battleman here to face off against him. Similar to how Rock Lee doesn't have ninjutsu, this guy just isn't affected by by the key attack. Khalifa comes in though in this sort of little moment where he's kind of talking to himself and head butts him right in the forehead. Doesn't really move him, does bloody him up a little bit, but leaves him open again for another kick attack. This is another key attack that, I mean like, come on Kaba, you know he's not effective by key, so why are you keep dishing it out? But I think it was for the explosion itself because the explosion left a cloud huge cloud all around him, leaving enough of an opening 
for the lieutenant to come in and actually strike him right in the face with a perfect blow. This to anybody else would be a knockout hit, but to someone like Salaga, it probably doesn't do much. But that's when Pepino comes back in with his tornado special move. This, remember, is the only move that really did some damage to him and exhausted the, the demon pretty easily in the last few chapters. And this is the only move that this guy actually physically had to force himself to dodge. So he dodged it only to be caught by Kaba again, who goes in for a galley gun while Super Saiyan 3 Khalifa goes in for a cannon crush right dead center right in his face but he is easily able to deflect both attacks remember he is not affected by key attacks whatsoever I don't know why they keep issuing it but they might not really remember or understand what his abilities are and how he keeps deflecting the key attacks. Khalifa yells at Kaba what the hell is he doing? Kaba says that his arm won't move anymore, it's completely paralyzed. And during this interim, this is when Salaga decides that he needs to take out Pepino. Pepino is literally the only one here that is around his level or at least close to it with enough hacks that he can actually damage this guy and so he's like, I'm going to take you out first, basically taking out the one guy that can actually do some damage to him, but Pepino is understanding the situation really clearly and tries to go in for another attack. Maybe the attack wasn't in full force or maybe there's a difference with the distance or the timing or whatever, but the attack does nothing to Salaga and he completely brushes it off only to go in for a death blow to try to kill Pepino again. But remember, Pepino can regenerate. He is essentially artificial, so he doesn't really have like the vital areas like everybody else would. And so I think that's part of Pepino's plan, to get in close to Salaga to basically hold him still and using that really weak attack because he knew that Salaga would go in for the kill, which he did. And at this point, Pepino's flesh is literally healing itself around Salaga's arm faster than Salaga can pull out the arm. And so basically he's stuck now inside, inside Pepino while Pepino is able to do his signature attack that can actually damage Salaga at point blank range with his entire body. But he won't let that happen and actually flies with Pepino trying to kind of get him out of the range that he needs and like get off his concentration but now he's realizing that he actually is in a little bit of trouble here at least his arm is it's stuck inside Pepino he'd have to rip Pepino in two to get his arm back but with the intensity and the devastating whiplash of the attack that Pepino has been basically throwing at this guy the entire time he gets close enough and strong enough of a attack to rip this dude's arm off completely and now he's gushing blood as he flies off into the into the opposite direction but look at his face his face doesn't tell me that he's worried at all his face tells me more that he's pissed off more than anything the lieutenant fires an arrow and all of them try to converge on this dude's landing spot the enemy is literally on the back foot here with one arm less and so he should be able to be easy pickings at this point and easily destroyed but now salaga is getting pissed off he's like damn it who the hell do you all think i am like you guys are all coming at me. One of you guys took my arm. Like, you guys think that I'm easy. You guys think that I'm a, uh, I'm child's play, which, you know, I'm nothing to play with. Remember, this guy is the second hand to the venerable heir, which is the excluded god of destruction. So this guy's pretty powerful in his own right. And he's shown that time and time and again in the entirety of Dragon Ball Kakume. So the fact that uh, they're doing this much damage to him is pretty admirable, but really is mainly Pepino and his hacks abilities, while the other two are trying, or the other or three are trying their hardest to kind of push him back but i mean like is it really is it really working that's the real question that is funny because i feel like this is gonna 100 percent fail but kava and khalifa are both coming in and like this entire page is just so dramatic with them coming in they're both giving it their all obviously khalifa giving more seeing as how she's a super saiyan 3 but still like they're completely in sync they've probably trained this before but they're both coming in with trying to give him the most out of whatever they can muster and try to damage him as much as possible and like that's the question is this gonna work is it not gonna work is there are they gonna do damage on this guy like is this guy really a pushover like that because you know Cobb and Khalifa are not even like god class types of saiyans like what's going on and that's when he he stops them <laughs> like he literally stops both of them in 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 mid-air as they are charging to him he's got Kaba by the neck and then he's manipulating his blood 
and using it as a hand around Caulifla's neck. He's got both of them by the necks. And that is when Kaba foolishly drops the capsule that Bulma is hiding in. Now Salaga is vigilant. He sees that this capsule falls and he notices that it's something, right? But look at this, he says, their heart beats abnormally fast. He's like thinking faster than they're moving, basically. Their eyes are riveted on this capsule because they're both staring at it. Oh, I see. Like he's starting to put the pieces together because of the way that Kappa and Khalifa are both acting around this capsule. And Khalifa is getting pissed off and just kind of giving it all away, like that the fact that this is something. But before she can even finish her sentence, her extent of using Super Saiyan 3 is at an end and she completely goes back to base form. And Khalifa is out of the picture. Kappa says that she hasn't master the form yet meaning like yeah she's gonna go right back to base and so he throws her away knowing and realizing that she's completely out of the fight and that is when he starts manipulating a clone out of his breath and this clone is heading toward the capsule this is where you're hiding Bulma and he's going straight for it and if he grabs it it's game over for Bulma, she's, she, if she's crushed like this, it's out, it's done. Like, end of the line, end of the picture. Pepino tries to regenerate during this time, but his robot, his, well, artificial being that's inside of him is completely out of, out of order. Like, it's not gonna work. So he can't regenerate anymore. Now, come on, Lieutenant, come on. You honestly have to have seen some battles here. Like, why are you so dismayed at this shit? Because like, She's like, oh, with me and Cabo alone, we're never going to be a match for him. She voluntarily, instead of trying to try to take out this guy while he's preoccupied with Kaba and going in to try to fight him, she gives up. She's like, it's over. She literally goes back to base on her own without anything else. But Kaba's standing on business and with him so close, he punches this guy straight in the face. Look how powerful that punch is. Like you can barely see this guy's face. It's completely blurry with blood and force. And he yells the famous line, don't you dare touch Mrs. Bulma. But again, it is all for nothing. He even says that the clone that's coming off him is about to destroy the capsule. I can only imagine this is happening so fast in such a small amount of time, but it's being drug out because they're, you know, that's, that's the way they're moving and they're thinking. They're thinking so slowly, but everything's happening so fast. And Kaba is just so upset here. He's like, I must find the strength as literally his claw is wrapping around the capsule that Bulma's hiding in. He's like, I must find the strength. And as he sees it get closer and closer and closer, he explodes into a mighty rage. Like we've never seen Kaba like this before. Lieutenant not being much help here. She's like, you can't even stand bro. Just give up. Why don't you just give up? But Kaba's like, hell no, I'm not giving up. I'm standing here on business. He says, I'm a Saiyan and I don't need to stand on my own two feet to rip you to pieces. He gets a little praise from the enemies as the look on your face is almost spine chilling because this is not Kaba ever so friendly, friendly neighbor next door type of guy. This is like, I'm gonna kill you if you touch that capsule. Like I'm going to rip your guts out type of Kaba. He uses all the strength that he's remaining to blast Salaga and it is absolutely no use. Like he literally just kind of blocks it, deflects it relatively easily with his hand. Salaga's like, what did you expect? Like, come on, seriously, what did you expect? But at least he tried, at least he did something. But that was probably his last action in this war because he gets shot right in the heart. And Kaba is finally out of the fight. And actually, I love this panel right here. I don't know why. It just looks extremely detailed and not like Dragon Ball at all. But I just like this panel a lot. Kaba is now down. Pepino's down. Khalifla's down. And the Lieutenant has given up. And I love the way that Salaga talks here. He's like, these things happen. You've given your all. It just wasn't enough. And I like that he's like kind of like a proud warrior. Like this is kind of like how I wanted Gas to be in Dragon Ball Super. Like more of a warrior like that. Like where he acknowledges the strengths of his opponents even though he's stronger than them. Instead of being like, ha ha ha, I'm stronger than you. Which is exactly what ended up happening at the end. So uh, I definitely like the way this is going. And boom. Bulma theoretically is no more. Because he shattered. Like we have to actually figure out what happens when you shatter these things. Like... Does everything inside just disappear? Like, is that how it works? He completely destroyed it. So like, is it completely gone out of existence? I know like each one's like a little pocket dimension kind of. So like, 
what happens to the pocket dimension? Do they get trapped in there like the uh, like the room of Sirid in time? Like what is going on? Either way, this dude like this is, has been his main mission given to him by the venerable heir for chapters now and he finally completed it finally finished it r.i.p bulma i'm hoping that she's still alive somehow but i don't see how she could be to be honest with you we are back with the newest chapter of dragon ball kakame and salaga has just killed bulma bulma was in her own design hideout capsule a capsule that you can hide in anybody can go inside and Salaga just killed her. At least that's what we're thinking happened, but let's jump into this chapter and see exactly what happens next. When Salaga opens his hand, it looks like almost a universe pops right out of the palm of his hand. This leads the lieutenant, the only other person that is still conscious in this fight, to stare at it with a sign of confusion, like she does not know what is going on. And for the first time in this entire arc, Salaga is stuck. He cannot move. Whatever is happening, whatever happened with the destruction of the capsule seems to not only have frozen him in place, but it seems to be whirlpooling him in, almost like the Mafuba. And instantly in his place, Bulma appears. Years. It looks like she did some sort of sorting magic trick where she switched places with Salaga as soon as he destroyed the capsule. The thing is, if he destroyed the capsule, where the hell was he going? The mini universe is still there? Like, what is going on? What did Bulma set him up to do? Bulma looks over and realizes that, yeah, they paid a huge toll in the price of blood when it comes to this this fight in protecting Bulma. The protecting Bulma arc has basically claimed several Saiyans over the last couple of chapters, but now the last ones that were left to defend her are all out of commission. They're not dead, but they're definitely out of commission. And then Bulma Cockley says, don't worry, I'll take care of the rest. And we can see here that Kaba is a little surprised, but he's still conscious. And we have here what looks like to be a completely different device. This is not the capsule that Salaga destroyed. This looks to be something completely different. And the way the whirlpool is heading into the top, looks like this is where Salaga was sent off to, the Hoi Poi trap. And Salaga plops inside, and yet it looks like he is now trapped in the mini universe that the pocket dimension that Bulma created inside the capsule. Looks like as soon as he destroyed it, a trap was set and he was placed in this universe and but basically Mafubad with technology. And I love this line delivery by Bulma. Hello, Mr. Demon. Here's your favorite target live from the vast lands of Sadala. So she can still talk to him through the little microphones on top. It doesn't seem like he can break through that very easily because then the trap wouldn't work. So whatever is this material is made out of, whatever this machine is made out of, is trapping him in here 100%. Even he seems a little bit confused as to what's going on. What have you done to me? She says, you thought I was helpless prey, and that was your biggest mistake. And I've been saying it for years, Bulma is an S-tier protagonist. She is definitely one of the strongest members of the Z Squad, Unaff unaffiliated member. She's definitely on the sidelines, more like an assistance than anything. But if you come up against her with technology, like you're always going to lose. I just didn't think that she was going to use technology against one of the strongest villains in Dragon Ball Kakami. I did not see that shit coming. And look at my boy. He is sweating here. He's like, how did he get tricked? Like, he's usually on his guard. The only reason that he was even able to find the capsule to destroy it was because he was kind of picking up on the cues of everybody looking at this capsule. He knew that that's where Bulma was hiding and that's where she was. But if he destroyed it, he didn't know that there was going to be a trap laid and he didn't know that the Earthling had that much of a technological advantage over him to lay that trap or even the foresight to lay it. Bulma set everything up. This was her whole plan. Check it out. She says, it's far from easy to get out of the Hoi Poi capsule, which I don't know what Hoi Poi means. I'm assuming it's some sort of uh, inside joke maybe or some so sort of hidden lore inside Dragon Ball Kakame. Maybe something I'm not thinking about in the in you know the past Dragon Ball, but Hoi Poi, you just 
just crush with your hands. There is in fact a voice command to be pronounced in Namekian, an almost dead language. So she could have gotten out of there easily by, you know, saying the Namekian phrase that nobody else knows. Nevertheless, if someone foolishly tries to force the opening or destroy the capsule from the outside, an emergency command is activated and then the assailant exchanges positions with the capsule's host. Once this happens, the capsule transforms completely into like a prison and there's no escaping out of it. Like you're basically stuck on the inside. And I love Bulma like describing her plan with Salaga and just kind of explaining like what ended up happening beforehand and not knowing the extent of Salaga's power before he came to attack them. She didn't know that he was gonna hunt her basically and she didn't know how powerful he was. So she never gave out any information to any of the other Saiyans. So they legitimately thought that she was destroyed as soon as the as soon as the capsule was broken. And look at the look at the Hoi Poi trap. It's like actually way bigger than the the original capsule. So it transforms into this thing, which seems to be some sort of like mini prison. And Bulma didn't want to give out any more information just in case this guy had telekinesis. So she basically kept this as her trap card. Like now you've activated my trap card. That's exactly what the Hoi Poi is. Bulma kept this secret close to the vest and kept it and mulliganed her chances of basically him destroying it and kind of bet that he would and he did. And he's kind of impressed because she's literally like an insect to these people and to anybody really in Dragon Ball, like easily killed basically, but she turned her scientific brain into an advantage to trap one of the most powerful creatures in existence. And she didn't do it alone. Not only was she inspired, like I said earlier, by the Mafuba, but she had help from the Tuffles. Remember, she had been on Planet Sadala for a little bit with the rest of the Saiyans before this attack. So she was with them and created this thing just in case they came up against a foe that was really, really powerful that nobody else could defeat and they could use this. So basically she made an artificial Mafuba. I'm assuming if it can trap this guy, it could trap anybody else in, in Dragon Ball. Literally Boo, Frieza, Cell, anybody. You're in prison miniaturized in this pocket dimension and I am safe, checkmate. And she won, I think. And the lieutenant is completely ashamed of herself here. She says, how could I have given up at such a time, damn it? Because she did. She basically gave up on, on this whole situation and ended up, uh, you know, not even trying. And we see here that Khalifa literally drops from exhaustion and, and is bleeding all over the place. And lieutenant runs over to Pepino to try to help him out. Like, she did give up and gave up the fight way too easily while the rest of them, even Khalifa, fought all the way to the bitter end. This is what I was afraid of because they had mentioned this earlier before they even arrived on planet Sadala. And um, yeah, this is Salaga the magician. He is the master of dimensions. He even was very integral in like the entire dimension that the Venerable Air was trapped in earlier in the story. So he has been given these dimension powers or has access to these dimension powers from the get go. So he says that they've trapped the wrong guy because he can manipulate dimensions 100%. And he says that even these little pocket dimensions, like I can kind of just slip right out of them. So you basically put me in a prison where I am the prison guard. I can get in and out whenever I want. And Salaga basically reverse checkmates, reverse Uno on Bulma because Bulma, like again, she had no information on this guy. She doesn't know anything about him. She doesn't know that he, you know, is a magician with dimensions or what a master of dimensions. So, you know, she has limited information on him and of course she would. So now, yeah, I, I, I knew this was, this was too easy. It was too good to be true. Although it would have been a really cool way for Salaga to go out, like just stuck in the little pocket Dimension, it would have been carrying him around for the rest of the thing. So uh, yeah, but if anybody broke the Hoi Poi, then they would be reversed into that dimension and, and changed places basically. So if the Venerable Air destroyed it, that would be what ended up happening. And poof, he's back out again, out of the pocket dimension. Like it was literally just like, it, it was a speed bump. This guy is completely overpowered. Khalifa realizing that, you know, there's still more to go. She actually gets up and uh, you know, she she's actually given a lot in this series and I actually like her characterization so much better in this. And, and I think they do ride a lot on how she acted in Dragon Ball Super. So this is very believable Khalifa characteristics. And Salaga gives his evil villain ending 
ending monologue here where he says, look at you, you're all struggling to stand up. You've surprised me and I sincerely congratulate you. Not many people have managed it, but the time has come to speed up. You wasted too much of my time. And he's absolutely right. He basically, they've they've chewed up a lot of his time, his precious, precious time at this point. And uh, yeah, they need to they need to hurry this up along. He needs to get back to the venerable air. With a force grab, he gets Bulma finally. Kaba rushes to try to do something, but he's too slow. And Bulma gets sucked into a portal. Obviously, this guy's the master of portals. I don't know why he was chasing them the old-fashioned way, though, uh, the entire time on the planet. But I guess he's the master of portals, so he can just teleport wherever he wants. And Bulma is officially trapped, and I mean, her days are numbered, it seems like. Papino asks for his savior to lend a little bit of the key that they have because his machine that is in his body that heals him responds to key. It only responds to key. So if it gets charged up a little bit, he can actually heal himself a little bit again and be a threat to Salaga again. And Khalifa stalls a little bit by calling him Drag Queen. And when he turns around, we get the funniest face from Dragon Ball Kakume. This is just like, look at Khalifa here. Like, she is just so goofy. Again, her characterization is just so awesome. And she's literally not giving a shit. And she's like, fuck you, Salaga. You are, you're, you're nothing, basically. She still has the energy to do this after everything she's been through. Everything everybody else has been through. Like, she doesn't give a shit. And Pepino, while he's distracted, kicks him in the back, tells everybody, do not follow me, and pushes him through the portal he just made into what could only be seen as maybe like the demon realm but it looks like it's a parallel dimension once he lands he sees that Bulma is trapped in this transparent cube and he says he's gonna get her out of here she says she believes him I mean it's gonna be tough the one thing I do realize from just them entering this dimension is the way the art style has shifted now. I mean, the art style is very scratchy. It looks almost like uh, like poster board. It just is very, very, very different from what we've been seeing thus far, which makes sense because this is a completely different dimension. And Salaga is still wondering what the hell is going on. These warriors are pushing him around and throwing him for a loop because Pepino literally just signed his death warrant. He has pushed him into this universe that he has no knowledge of and no way to go back it's basically a death sentence but Pepino is completely 100% motivated to kill him he says that hey we're both at the end of our rope here and uh, yeah if you if you are willing to fight I'm willing to fight you and we're gonna fight and I'm going to save Bulma they both power up and Pepino launches at Salaga Salaga is trying to use anti space punch and Pepino uses his abilities to create some sort of protection right in front of him that will block this attack. The attack is successfully blocked and Pepino literally just throws his entire body into Salaga knocking him down using kind of twirling force but it looks like maybe just the beginning portion of it like he didn't actually kind of pull the entire thing off. And Salaga does not like the direction this fight is going. He doesn't like Pepino this close to him because of Pepino's abilities so he kicks him off to try to get him some distance between them. Pepino launches right back and he's powering up looking almost like a lightning bolt again he's trying to get as close to Salaga as possible because that's how potent his abilities can make him by getting this close he can actually really end this fight and he hits Salaga again right into the molten lava and Salaga is just getting so pissed off because he has no real counter to this attack and since the beginning this has been the only thing that has hurt him and so he rips off his shirt and he is just yelling I am sick of you because he's so tired of Pepino at this point in time he just doesn't want to deal with him anymore and he's tired of being pushed back so much when these are just weak mortals. You may be giving me a hard time, but you have no idea how much magic I've acquired over 403,986 years, and I intend to show it to you, meaning that he still has more in the tank, believe it or not. He's got more abilities up his sleeve. Pepino's in a bit of a shock here from seeing like just how much reserves this guy's got. And he says, I'm going to grind you into dust, Pepino. Like he's going into like some sort of vampiric demon rage. I could honestly say that we can call this demon timer here. And he looks so cool. Look at the detail in this. Like the artwork in this 
Dragon Ball fan manga. It's an official manga. Like, this is official manga artwork. It almost looks like Berserk. It's so cool. He says, I'm not impressed, Salaga. And Salaga is like, that's like the final straw. He just like rushes at him and look at him. He just looks far more demonic than normal. Like, he just looks so crazy here. He's trying to time it right because his hardware is able to block all the blows. He says the blow is coming from the left. So all he's got to do is block it from the left. But that's the thing. The blow doesn't come from the left. It comes from from the right with his ability reverse space punch and it comes into his blind spot and this completely takes Pepino by surprise and it looks like it could have permanently taken his left or his I mean his right arm out of commission completely and he hits him again and again and Pepino's realizing he can't take this sort of beating for far too much longer like he's going to die if he keeps going the thing is healing him but there is going to be a limit and Salaga's so just like oh our dear scientist is activating his defense mechanisms you seem to be running out of options meaning that like he is at his end when it comes to his tricks because they both have tricks up their sleeve one is magical and one is technical so Salaga throws a bunch of black smoke right into his shield this smoke could possibly be toxic to Pepino and Salaga says this is going to get you out of that shell he's using almost like nine grams palm rotation or like a sphere or a barrier sphere so yeah Pepino launches out of there and he says this guy literally won't let me breathe this is like a really good fight like it's very very strategic which is something that we don't see very often in Dragon Ball the smoke begins to surround Pepino, but it's not actually smoke because the smoke is connected to Salaga and Salaga is able to grasp onto Pepino and he seems to be like sucking his soul out or maybe his just his air out of his lungs. That's exactly what it is. Salaga is stealing his vitality, his key, his soul, and it's a technique that he's learned just recently, a few hundred years recently, while he was trapped in that dimension with the with the venerable air. He is sucking out the entire soul of Pepino and and this could be the end of him. But instead of his soul coming out, it's actually his artificial buddy, Kebia, coming out of his mouth. And Kebia punches Salaga, then transforms into armor around Pepino. And it looks like stabilization 100% complete. Post, he's activated armor mode around him. This seems to be more likely the last straw that Pepino has against Salaga. Bulma's impressed, but Salaga is not. He is done with these tricks. He's ready to take Pepino out completely. Kebia, so you were evolving on your own all this time. Let's see how much it's worth, meaning that his artificial entity has been basically working on the side to, to better protect his master, essentially. And this guy makes him strong enough to not only catch up quickly into Salaga's chest, but push him through molten barrier rock all the way across the planet's landscape and it looks like it made him on equal footing strength wise with Salaga and Salaga punches him back and yeah it's a very hefty punch and he's bleeding a lot here but he could be dead if if he didn't have this armor on him and Salaga is impressed with Pepino 100% but I mean, he's got to do what he's got to do at this point. He's taking way too much of his of, of the venerable air's time dealing with this guy. And so he says, stop this if you can. Finally, we're getting to the finishers and he, I don't know, transforms into Goro, this ability that grants him several more arms. I'm assuming he's going to attack him with key from each of those arms, making or amplifying his abilities and his strength. And that's exactly what it is. It's just he's punching the air and shooting uh, attacks at him similar to what he was doing earlier so he is going to be hitting him thousands of times over with these attacks like a gatling gun almost like luffy's gum gum gatling but pepino easily dodges all of them and that's because he is basically analyzing where these punches are going to end up where they're going to drop and he's just moving casually out of the way so this attack this final finisher attack he's completely dodging it like he's got ultra instinct and so he decides you know what i'm going to go with a giant blast and if you move out of the way and try to uh you know and try to dodge this one it'll kill not only whatever planet this is that we're on but it'll kill bulma as well no choice but to stop this attack cold in its tracks he says he can't lose not now not when everybody is counting on him and i mean he's gone above and beyond here way more way more powerful than than any of the other saiyans really that we've seen so far that were defending bulma so he is their trump card he says that just let it happen 
just lie down. Don't worry. I'm going to drop you. I'm going to take away your pain. You don't got to worry about nothing. Just let this happen. And Pepino yells out, Salaga, master of dimensions, you've already lost. To everybody's surprise, Pepino had shot through the blast with his own abilities, threw it like a knife, and this cuts right into the dead center of Salaga. And what ended up happening is the first use of non-key attack against someone wielding key. Key is not supposed to harm Salaga, yet he knew that, and he knew that he would know that. So he would be left wide open essentially for a artificial attack, one made out of his uh, his buddy basically the guy whose armor he's wearing this is just made out of it it's just a giant spear and that's exactly what ended up happening cut right through the attack and shot right through salaga's heart he says here we are at the conclusion salaga and salaga says well done hybrid i must admit you've won and that is the end of this chapter what a crazy battle guys venerable heir doula and you my brother I count on you. And with that, one of the most feared villains of Dragon Ball Kakume is finally defeated. I failed my mission, so as a matter of principle, I'm letting you go back out there with that Bulma. On the other hand, Amaron's more reckless than I am. You'd better think twice about what you want to do against him. And with that, the Tuffle also has reached his limit, battling across multiple manga chapters. It's finally over. And with the help of his trusty android, they have finally kept Bulma safe. The promise that Kaba kept to Vegeta all those chapters ago has finally been kept. You did it! I can't thank you enough! Miss Bulma! Pepino! And what about him? asked the lieutenant. Pepino vanquished him. Well done. And I do gotta agree with all of them that Pepino definitely came out on top here. He pushed it to the very limit, did everything he could to keep Bulma safe, keep his promise, and he wasn't even there to hear the promise in the first place. He came in in the third quarter and he absolutely squashed it. This young man, thinks Lieutenant, I can't believe it. Pepino, we should join your mother and the other isolated inhabitants. I'll be safe and the others will take care of the rest. I wonder how the others are doing. Has Kale managed to calm Broly down? I'm having trouble sensing her key. Let's not waste any more time and get back to Kale. The king of planet Sadala stands before the demon Dula. He is at his utmost state, completely ripped and filled with Saiyan power, cursed Saiyan power that he told himself he would never grasp again. Ah, so you can change your hair color too. Blonde might suit me too. I hate this feeling. It feels like I'm being... I have to put it aside. Let's be done with this primitive people of good for nothing. Arrogant, believe me, you and your colleagues won't be the catalyst for Sadala's downfall. And with that, Dula attacks, but stops himself mid-flight, mid-attack, to the king's confusion. Where Salaga? The bond between us seems to have broken. No, I must be mistaken. It's impossible. The king tries to take this time to strike Dula, to finish it. He is not letting him dictate the terms of the fight, but that's all that Dula does. He dictates the terms of the fight with his portals. Ugh, portals are a real problem. At this rate, I could put myself out of business. Uh... Goes in for the attack once more, just a trick, and completely bypasses the portal, Punching Dula, striking the demon straight in the face. His temperament and attitude have changed completely. What is going on? Earlier, a dimension opened up and I felt our link gradually fade away. I don't understand. You're really missing out, but I've got responsibilities to fulfill and if you don't want to face me, I'm going to cut the fight short. He would indeed be... Uh, uh, I don't think you understand that you're no longer my priority, but if you insist the way he moves, 
is abnormal as Dula twists and contorts his body to fit whatever form of fighting he prefers. The king tries to strike again, but this strike is completely dodged as Dula closes in. If Salaga really is what I think it is, I can swear on my honor that I'll take great pleasure in devouring every citizen of your bloody planet. Another strike by the king, another dodge. Boom, 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 boom. And with quick succession, Dula immediately heals every single one of his outstanding wounds. Could have done this all along, but he was playing with the king. Now his priorities have shifted because his partner is defeated. What is it? A capacity for recovery? And as the king Dio walks towards Dula, Dula opens up another portal and his hand snaps the king's ankles while another hand portals in from behind. You do not really think I'm going to let myself as Dula grabs the back of his neck. What was that? Down. As Dula continues to push down on the king's neck towards the ground. Now he's got a firm grip around his throat and what he does next will shock you. With one portal, he yeets him through another portal into fat bearded scum. Instead of acting tough by cauterizing your gut all by yourself, you should have made sure you don't get hit twice in the same place. As Dula knees him in the wound he just healed. Emergency heal too, like this wasn't a normal heal. He had to cauterize this wound that Dula opened up in his chest, so it's gonna be far more sensitive and far more vital for him to keep that from getting hit twice, and he did not. Which goes to show the difference in power between even just how epic of a Super Saiyan the King actually looks compared to Dula who was already on that level where he could withstand some of the attacks that Broly was lobbing at him. A normal Super Saiyan is not gonna be able to to compete whatsoever. Ugh, I think that you're as well placed as I am to understand that this injury won't stop me. A blow for a blow. And he gets a nice clean strike right into Dula's face. The only problem with this situation is that he's already struck Dula several times over. He's already fought him, he's already made him bleed, and none of this is enough to put Dula down. None of this is enough to really hurt him. Even when Dula had his guard down, none of it was enough to end the fight. Dark hands again come from the void and wrap themselves around. Choose no. Chilai and Lemo are all we've got. They're our friends, our family. That bloody demon has to pay. Whatever it takes, rage is the key to our revenge. No, this strength, this innate fury only leads to bad results. It makes us hurt our friends and... 
You're wrong. Power governs the laws of this world. With this power, no one will dare attack those closest to us. And before our enemies begin to fear us, how many victims must we claim? How many more lives are we going to have to crush with our hands to make our attackers understand that they should never have attacked us? Huh? Go on, tell me. You just don't understand. We have to. You're the one who doesn't understand. You're nothing more than a catalyst for my negative emotions, powerful enough to cause harm to my own friends, even those who are doing the maximum to dissuade me. It took Kale to rubbing death because of me to realize I thought I was acting to protect our loved ones, but in the end, I only made them feel fear. Our enemies used me to achieve their goals, and here's where we are now. Where are you going? Come back, you can't get rid of me like that. Don't insist. I'll never again resort to this uncontrollable animosity. So that's your plan? You're gonna give up your only chance to destroy this damn demon? Do you really think you can contain the power that lies dormant inside you and that'll never stop growing? I'm going to deal with you and trust my friends. It's true that this power helps me, but from now on I'll be using you, not the other way around. You're never going to make it, I swear. Shut up, your majesty. I'm going to finish you off right now. Crack. Here comes the gorilla once again. As Broly finally masters his legendary form. With one solid movement, Broly grabs Dula's arm and takes it away. You can tell just the the face that Dula's making. It's not the confident, cocky face he's had this entire this entire arc. He is completely serious, and now I think he's starting to realize the the reality of the situation here and i love that he remarks right here he said that he doesn't look mad anymore because the entirety of the broly versus doula or the broly versus anybody uh fight in this arc in kakumi at this point in time has been broly really pissed off broly losing his his mind and so at this point in time it's very clear that after broly essentially killed kale it's not verified if she's dead yet, but it seemed like in the last chapter he killed her. He is now, with that sacrifice like Itachi before him, he has unlocked a brand new ability. And that is Mastered Ikari, is the only thing that I can think of. And I like that Broly is just so much more tranquil. And he almost reminds me of when Goku first went into Ultra Instinct and how calm he was and how fast he was because in that second of removing Dula's arm he literally went to sit beside the king who was having his own like PTSD moment and you know confronts Dula at the same time. Broly apologizes to the king obviously Broly went berserk instead of taking out Saiyans and so that was not you know part of the plan. The plan was for them to train and then for Broly to master Ikari before the war started. Nobody knew the war was going to come to Sadala this quickly and so Broly realizing the king is completely out of it the king has his own issues, his own demons to face. He completely knocks him out. And he has spurred the anger of whatever remaining Saiyans there are. They're upset for him knocking out their king. Like, beating up all their all their warriors wasn't enough for him. But no, one of the lieutenants says that no. This is Broly finally in control at last. And it looks like he just knocked out the king to save him. Broly is now thinking clearer than ever. He says, please get your king to safety. When all this is over, I'll accept my punishment. He is ready to meet Dula. The Saiyans don't take orders from Broly. Obviously, after the beating, they're probably sour from him, but the lieutenant tells him, go ahead and follow what he's saying. Let's go. And we get our first image of Master Dikari Broly. And it is essentially as big as you can make Broly in the Berserker form, but not look overly grotesque and not look overly out of control. He is fully under his own control. Uh, it is unclear whether he's got a different color. I would assume it's still that green yellow color to him, but he has like that look in his eyes. His pupils are back. He is fully in control of his new transformation. You and Dula looks like he tried to one-shot Broly before it was too late. 
but Broly's just standing on business. He's not moving from his location. The explosion goes off and Broly still is standing there coming through the clouds. He is completely unharmed. So Dula tries another blast. This is obvious Dragon Ball Z villain trying everything in his arsenal to take out the, the good guy at this point because he doesn't understand how he got a new transformation, doesn't understand why he's this powerful, but he's going to start throwing everything he's got at him. Frieza did it before, Cell did it before, and now Dula's doing it too. But again, that blast did nothing. But in this shot right here, we can see a little bit more of the other transformations that we've seen from Broly up to this point. The dark cell shading from the overwhelming crazy Broly that we saw, the transformation that we saw where he's fully blacked out. We see far more of his anatomy, like he is completely bulky, ripped, he is completely lean, but at the same time like at least double the size of his original form. So he is literally in a new transformation right now. Broly just reaches out his hand just in this panel alone, look how beautiful this panel is. He's reaching out his hand, but as we see the transition, it is him clasping on the shoulder of Dula. And he tells him, you can regenerate, right? He says, that's how you did it, huh? And he stabs him in the chest the same way that Dula did to the king. I don't know if Dula can regenerate out of this one. He did seem to regenerate his hand, but... This is a giant Broly-sized, Ikari-controlled, Ikari-mastered attack, sword attack right through him. So I think this might be the end of this character. That was for Chilai. Now regenerate. You're gonna pay for it. I can assure you. See what you've just done? Chilai wasn't so lucky. Come on. And this guy has been... Like Dula, he's been just the bane of Kakumi up to this point right now. Taking out Chilai, trying to uh, part of the team to take out Bulma, and then at the same time uh, pushing Broly to basically not only take out all the Saiyans, but also take out take out Kale. And then we have all the, the entire situation that happened with the King, his PTSD being triggered. Everything is connected to Dula. Dula is... To be honest, from what we've seen so far, he's definitely the deadliest out of all the villains that we've seen from Kakumi up to this point. Broly focuses his fist in Dula's face, but doesn't actually hit him. It's like this sort of like little whirlpool black hole attack comes out of it and punches him right in the face, snapping his head back. That is when Dula activates his trap card. He uses thousands of portals. Remember, Dula is the master of portals, and within those portals, Key blades, it seems like, or key arrows start coming through them, attacking Broly. And they're all over the place, so Broly cannot dodge these. And he doesn't. He literally just flexes and they bounce right off. So, yeah, he's completely fine. It, it looks like whatever power gap that Dula was with Broly, it's completely amplified now. And this is the first time, the real first time, that we're seeing a mastered Ikari Broly in charge of his own senses. And it's really interesting because in the Dragon Ball Serum manga, that's exactly what's going on at this moment. Dula, Venerable Heir, Salaga, died. Unleash yourself. With Dula unlocking a new ability or maybe unleashing a new form, Broly finally catches up to him and the only difference in this new transformation is just markings on Dula's eyes but maybe he's got more mastery over, over black holes in this new form. In that moment he unleashes what can only be seen as key whips and he actually manages to use his key, I guess in this new form, to cut through Broly's skin. So now whatever new transformation or unleashment he did, he is now getting closer to that Broly level of power. Like these god assistants, I guess, or assassins and sorcerers, they are way overpowered when it comes to Dragon Ball characters here because this guy was literally just completely weakened from Broly and now he just from a little transformation is now getting closer to his level. What's wrong with him? The force of his blow and his precision increased tenfold. I didn't see it coming. Could it be his magic? My physical strength far less developed than yours, but my magic can make up for this without any problem. I am Dula the Summoner and I'll show you what the honor of my nickname is worth. He's gone. 
Show me how you defend yourself against them. And just like I thought, he is seemingly having an amplified ability with whatever he just did. The power he just unleashed has amplified not only his 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 magic, but also how great of, of an amplification his magic can actually hold. Because earlier his magic really wasn't having too much of an effect before he did the marking. So now his marking has been extremely amplified, even though his strength, physical strength, has not. So there's still the issue with him that if Broly can get a hold of him, he can probably rip him apart because his physical body isn't as strong as whatever magic he's displaying here. But just like I said, giant portals, the portals are now quadruple, if not quintuple, the size that they were a minute ago. And with that, we get summoned creatures. The first real time that we're seeing Dula use an ability to summon monsters. And these guys kind of look like the demons that we just saw from Dragon Ball Daima, but not as goofy as the ones we saw from Dragon Ball Daima's trailer. They are huge, at least, at least great ape size or cell max size. They're ginormous. Broly not wasting any time, literally takes one of them out with a single punch cracking through his skull, blood everywhere, but this attack left him open for a counter attack from one of the other ones, and this attack punches him straight into the ground. The creatures think that they pin Broly down, but Broly is not out. He uses his key breath, I'm assuming key attack from his mouth, using his key attack to basically punch back, and this is enough to push the hand away, but the monster uses his own key breath, and now we have a key clash. Broly is at the same level of these creatures, it seems like, at least with how much key he's distributing here, and you can see here, he's using everything that he's got to push these guys back or in an attempt to destroy as many as he can single-handedly. And with just all the strength that he had, he manages to succeed and blew them up head first. They're completely dead, but you can see here that he is essentially overworked there's blood spewing from the cuts from earlier like he is he went to that limit to destroy these monsters Broly says this form is not permanent this form exhausts him greatly and if he loses concentration and focus he could lose control yet again so he's I mean he's dealing with a lot here when it comes to the pros and cons of this transformation but just as he's thinking this, he gets attacked by another creature. But as easily as the last one, he takes that one out to the shock of Dula. He thinks that these creatures are indestructible. Broly is proving that completely wrong. So now we're at a time limit of how many creatures Dula can actually summon compared to Broly and how long he can last in the Master Hikari. He throws him in the air and he's completely out of the stratosphere, gone into space, then he comes right back down to attack the last one, which this one looks almost like Hollow Ichigo just in a far bulkier and far more muscular form. And as he says, you're the last one, he goes right past his fist, right past his arm, and just uses himself to headshot him. Broly headshot completely disintegrates his brain, killing the creature. And at this point now, he's looking for Dula. He's like, this guy has wasted enough of my time. Where the hell is he? He said, behind you, I've summoned the mothership. And if I remember this correctly, this is the ship that they actually came in. So... Uh, Broly thinks it's useless, but we see here that he's struggling to keep himself sane. And as he destroys the mothership, Dula notices that it seems Broly has lost control again. And luck is finally on Dula's side, because Broly losing control means that he's going to not target Dula specifically. He might attack somebody else. He might attack the entire planet. Seeing his opening, Dula uses the portals to punch Broly's just rock him twice. I mean, I don't see a scenario here where Dula can kill Bro Broly, even if Broly is in the Berserker form, you can't get past the Broly transformation. And, and it looks like it didn't last very long because Broly now basically got slapped right back into his Master Ikari. You all came here just to hurt me and my friends. I'll never be able to forgive you. And now you can no longer escape. I'm just a pawn on the chessboard, my dear. But don't worry. I take responsibility for everything I do. Yeah, I'm stuck here. Too bad for you. And this is interesting because we have not seen this in months. And, and Dula looks over and sees, he can kind of see a glimpse of Vegeta pushing the Venerable Air back. Like, he's got him in almost like an arm bar with his entire body. And it looks like even the Venerable Air is having difficulties here. So, 
I mean, these guys, their mission to get to the gods is not something that may even happen because they're being stopped at this planet. I'm sorry, but I've made my choice. And it looks like we are heading into the ending of this chapter and this arc with Dula. More than likely, the next chapter is going to be the end of this fight where Broly can finally kill this guy. And then we're going to be getting to the Vegeta versus an actual god or ex-god of destruction and see how that actually fares. And if Vegeta ends up going into, like, may say some, some like Ultra Ego or or something along those lines. I don't know if that's going to be in here, but let me know what you guys think of this new chapter. It's going to be Blackscape signing off. Take care, guys. Subscribe for more content.